Good evening. Welcome to the King George County Board of Supervisors and King George County School Board meeting. It is now 531. I'll call to order the Board of Supervisors, Mr. Bush. And I will call to order the meeting of the King George County Schools in this joint session. All righty. Um, Mr. Bush, would you do the invocation? Sure. I would stand. I would pray. Our gracious almighty God, we're just so thankful for who you are. Lord, we ask for your presence during this uh, joint meeting. Lord, in everything that we do, um, we ask that we're always cognizant of your presence in our lives, your presence in what we do and all the decisions that we make. Lord, be with us as we consider the uh, entire county of King George, not only the students, but all of the people that are part of this county. And Lord, we'd ask that um, in everything that we do, we're always serving um, you first but we serve the county. So, Lord, help us in these decisions that we need to make. Guide us, direct us, Lord. And we just thank you that um, you're always constant and you're always on the throne. Let's be Christ that we pray. Alrighty, so when uh, all board members, when we get to the subject matter um, for discussion, we will first get a presentation and then we'll go around uh, for your first take on the presentation and then we'll come back. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman, are there any comments, public comments? I haven't got there yet. I was set the stage for a little bit. Go. <laughs> and, um, Everybody's going to give a first shot for two minutes, and then we'll come back. And we'll have a full discussion, for the, and the uh, um, floor will be open. This floor will be open for discussion. All righty. The first thing is public comments. Comments will be limited to three persons, three minutes per person. In order to afford everyone an opportunity to speak, please provide your full name, district, and submitting your public comments so it can be properly included in the record. Is there anyone for public comment? Seeing none, is there anyone online? None? No, Mr. Chairman. All righty. Is there anything to be read in the record? Anyone? Seeing no. none, all righty, we'll move right on. Discussion on amending the proposed King George County budget accounts payable specialist position. Are, are we, are we going George out? School projected revenues, the funding and request? Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay, so good evening, Chairman Collins, Chairman Bush, members of both the uh, Board of Supervisors and School Board. If you'd like to draw your attention to either screen, you also have a copy of the projected revenue and funding request presentation. It looks like uh, this in front of you if you wanted to take notes. This is uh, parts of the original presentation we gave to the school board for our revenue and funding request. And uh, we most certainly appreciate the opportunity this evening to share this with the Board of Supervisors. So first, uh, let's take a look at King George County Schools by the numbers. King George County Schools does have 715 employees. We currently serve uh, almost 4,500 students as of today. Uh, the formatting on that next one is a little bit uh, out of whack, but we do have seven school facilities in the county right now to include the preschool and the school board office and the transportation garage as well. We currently, uh, after school, host uh, 37 VHSL activities and middle school sports. And right now we have 544 students, so almost a school full of elementary school students participating in after school tutoring program. And anyone that's uh, been any part, a parent, a teacher, a, a coach of King George County Schools, you certainly know what impact we have uh, on the community and one that continues to grow. So first I wanna talk a little bit about the uh, process and the inputs that go into budgeting for a school division. It's a little bit different than uh, maybe some of the other counties uh, in King George. 
and it has uh, it's it's a bit of a, a calculus equation as it pertains to state funding, federal funding, and local funding. So this was our timeline that uh, we were hoping to stick to, uh, and, and we did stray a little bit from it this year. However, it's very similar to what we did last year. We start the budget process in early November uh, with, with community outreach and, and uh, gaining information from our staff, gaining information from individuals in the community. Uh, and then really, when, right when we come back at the beginning of the new year, we start crafting a budget with all of that information we gain from our stakeholders. We then begin to build the budget and uh, through February and March of last year, we talk about things like compensation increases, healthcare increases. And if you look at last year's schedule, around the second week of March was when we presented the, the budget to the Board of Supervisors. And the first week of April was when we had a joint uh, budget work session with the Board of Supervisors. Prior to the CIP presentation, and if you guys remember last, really two years, uh, the budget really stretched all the way into uh, late June. So we were working through budget issues all the way through late June. So I wanted to show you a little bit about, um, you know, where we are this year, just so we're all on the same page. I know a lot of us uh, have talked a little bit about um, where we are and, and where we've been through this process. So we started, I'm looking at the far left-hand side of this, this uh, time graph. Again, we started just like last year in early November on our town halls. We continued town halls through December. December 20th was when Governor Yunkin's initial budget came out. So an important thing to, to appreciate, I guess, is in the, in the sequence of events, first the governor's budget comes out at the end of the, the uh, uh, FY20, or excuse me, um, 2023. And then we wait some time, we work on the governor's budget, but then we wait some time before we get some information from the General Assembly. So you can see, that uh, we received the governor's budget on December 20th. We started working through some of the finer points of that budget, and we received the calc tool in the middle of January. Uh, the school board reviewed health care options. The Board of Supervisors and the Citizen Advisory budget work sessions began in and around January. So again, we're deep in the budget process towards the end of January. And I know uh, in, in reviewing your meetings, this was around the time that you guys began working with uh, the county departments and, and going through a few presentations before I think you guys started uh, holding off on those and, and, until Mr. Rasavi could work through some things with the budget. Uh, so on February 12th, I presented the budget to our school board. February 26th, we had a work session to work out some of the finer points. And then February 27th is when uh, Mr. Rasavi and I met to discuss the school budget. Now this budget at this time was the initial governor's budget. This was, I think, an allocation of 960000 which Mr. Rasavi and I have talked about. So when we crunched the budget for, uh, based on the governor's recommendations, the local request was 960000 So in other words, putting all of the numbers into the calc tool, the amount that we needed at that time based on the governor's budget was $960,000. Shortly after that, in fact, Mr. Rasavi and I were on the phone waiting, is there a calc tool? Is there a calc tool? Is there a calc tool? The General Assembly calc tool was released. We thought it was sooner, but it ended up being towards the end uh, of March. And then really within a, a quick time frame, our finance department of one uh, turned around and um, reissued our budget based on the numbers from the General Assembly. So at that time, we were under the assumption that, the, that based on the General Assembly budget, uh, we would need from the local government $122,648. And Mr. Rasavi and I worked on that. And very shortly after that, you see in red that finance discovered the error, error in the calculation that was right around April 10th. And then uh, those dates are messed up, excuse me. That, that should be April 3rd. Looks like those got uh, crossed over. April 3rd, the, the uh, error was found. April 10th was our next school board meeting. The school board did amend the budget at that time. And that's where we stand tonight. Uh, tonight, after we, we found that calculation error, the, the total operating request from the school division is uh, 1.7 million. And I, I can stop there for any questions, or I can continue going on, wh whichever you would prefer, Mr. Chair. You can go ahead and finish your presentation. Go ahead and finish, okay, thank you. 
All right, so again, in developing the budget, our responsibility or my responsibility as superintendent is really to create a needs-based budget. And we do that with all of those uh, multicolored circles that, that flow into uh, my responsibility to create a needs-based budget. I can tell you that going into this process this year, and I think this is an important point, we took an appreciation of where we are as a county, uh, some of the challenges we, some of the fiscal challenges we have in the county, and going into this budget, uh, knowing our responsibility is to create a need-based budget, we really sat down with all of those departments and all of those stakeholders and said, hey, look, this is the big picture. This is where we are in the county. Please, let's see what we can do to make sure that we can, you know, live harmoniously together as, you know, the services that are needed in the county as well as the school board. So we went into this with the understanding that we needed to um, recognize uh, where the county was as a whole. We then deliver that to the school board, and here we are tonight uh, delivering to the Board of Supervisors. So uh, some of this formatting didn't come out when we uh, uploaded it on this end, but a big part of school funding, and I won't uh, harp on this long, but is average daily membership. So in other words, the state gives us a certain amount of money based on how many students we believe we're going to service next year. So if you can see on the far right-hand side, or excuse me, if you, if you look at that bar graph, you can see over the last six years, our numbers, we're estimating in the Calc tool that next year we'll service uh, 4,390 students. In this slide, it's always important to, to take a look at the, the enrollment on the right-hand side of each of our schools, student enrollment, and that's in comparison to the capacity of all those buildings. So as we continue this conversation tonight about preschool, uh, those numbers in the gray table there will become more and more important. Uh, local composite index. So again, this is, uh, I've heard from many of your meetings, I think Ms. Bender, you pointed this out at one meeting, uh, the JLARC study came out, they talked about how school funding uh, across the Commonwealth is, is outdated. However, we're still working off of a local composite index at this time. Uh, local composite index is basically a way that the state ranks all 132 localities, uh, and it gives you a number. This slide just goes to show you that currently, our number in King George County is 0.3633, meaning that 36% of the budget is typically covered by the locality and the remainder is covered by the state and federal. Uh, that LCI is a calculation of your true value of real estate property, the gross income in the county, and the taxable retail sales. All right, so our budget alignment in this coming year, again, in trying to move our school division forward, in 2022, we came together with a group of about 40 stakeholders. Uh, they, it was a diverse group. I think there were Board of Supervisors members on it at the time, school board members, faith-based leaders, business owners, uh, school employees. We all came together and crafted a King George County School strategic plan. In that plan, we, we decided on four goals. Those goals are there. And you will see our budget presentation really wraps itself around those four goals. The other thing that we do in the budget process is make sure that we hear from our staff. This is a slide that simply says, we simply ask our, our teachers, do you have the equipment you need, the supplies you need, and the programs you need? And all three of those prior graphs say about nine out of 10 teachers are telling us right now that they have what they need to do their job in terms of equipment, supplies, and programs. The next section down there, staff suggestions. In that survey, we provide them an opportunity to give uh, qualitative feedback. In other words, they can write in comments. Of the comments that they suggested, 47% of them said, said that we needed to improve our employee investment. 25% said we needed to improve instruction. 2% said we needed to improve our collaboration with community. And 27% said we needed to improve our uh, safe and secure uh, school buildings. So here's, here's our initiatives, and this is initiative number one. Our first and, and probably foremost initiative is to increase salaries by 1% per Governor Yunkin's recommendation, and this includes a step. So if you guys, too loud? Okay, I'll be quiet, I'll push this away. I don't really need that microphone. Uh, thank you. So again, increasing our salaries by 1% and providing every teacher a step. That is a total cost of $1 million to the school division. Now, 
don't get caught up in that cost as far as that being the cost to the local government. That's, that's a combination of the cost to the school division, which includes state funding as well. The next initiative we had was to uh, standardize and modernize our, our stipends. Our stipends are any amount of payment that we give to coaches, to advisors, to grade level chairs. They haven't been changed in over 20 years. And uh, we really need to modernize those because it's getting harder and harder to find people to, to do those positions. The third is to, and I know we've talked about this a little bit, adjusting some compression that we have in the pay scale. And I'll go through this quickly. In 2008 to 2012, we had the economic downturn. This is when the housing uh, bubble burst. This is when, for four years, salaries in most of the Commonwealth, as far as education is concerned, were frozen. That compression still exists in our pay scale, and the way that it works is it works its way through our pay scale. So for the teacher pay scale right now, that compression is at steps six through steps 10. So if you've been a teacher for six years, all the way up to 10 years, instead of getting a 2% salary increase over those four years, you get a 0.75% increase. And if you think about that, teachers that are in their sixth through 10th year are probably at a time in their life where they're getting ready to make some pretty important decisions. Marriage, child, staying in this profession or not. And right now in our pay scales, we're really pensioning. So what we were hoping to do is adjust that compression, not all within one year, but systematically over the next likely four years. If we were just to adjust the compression in step six, it's a cost of $359,000 because when you adjust that uh, compression in step six, anyone at step six and beyond receives uh, a small bump in their salary. And what this does is it really gets all of those people that work through that economic downturn back on track to, uh, you know, with these salary increases that they should have gained through that difficult time. Finally, on this slide, we currently have a practice in King George County and, and maybe in, in the county as well, where if you do not choose the county health care, you get a $20 a month payment, uh, which is very nominal and one that really doesn't make a whole lot of difference for our employees after speaking to them. So in other words, if you don't choose our county health care after taxes, it's probably $15 a month that your paycheck goes up. Across the division right now, that cost us annually $63,000. We'd like to get rid of that program. Uh, what we'd like to do is increase our sick leave payout. Right now, you have a, uh, we have a $5,000 sick leave payout. We'd like to increase it. Uh, and this is only for invested employees that have been with King George County for a vested amount of time. Really what this does is this keeps our teachers in the classroom. Uh, right now, there's a situation, not just in education, but where many will believe that taking the day off and using their leave is more valuable than keeping their leave. I wanna convince them that keeping their leave and turning it in at the end of their career is more valuable than burning through it. Uh, and that way, we keep them in front of the children in the classroom, which I think is valuable. Okay, the next slide has to do with strategic plan goal number two. This has to do with our instruction. I think many of us know, or and if we don't, Governor Yunkin had an initiative uh, coming into um, office to provide lab schools across the state of Virginia. King George County Schools, is fortunate enough to be able to participate in one of those lab schools through the University of Mary Washington. It's a great opportunity. However, it's an expensive opportunity. So we have seven seats in that program currently. It'll be unbelievable for those students. It'll be great for our community. Uh, however, it does have a price tag of a total price tag of $59,500. The next bullet there, number two, the Virginia Literacy Act recently passed in the state of Virginia. It's a great program. It talks about how to teach the science of reading and make sure that our students can read by the time they get out of the primary school. Great program. However, many have termed it as an unfunded mandate. So this isn't our program. This is a program that the state says, we think there's a better way to teach reading. We're gonna tell every school division in the state of Virginia how to do it. And by the way, 
you have to buy these textbooks, you have to buy this software, and you have to hire these people. So all of those costs, even, even in number uh, three there, our transition, we're transitioning our reading specialist to coaching roles per the state, and we have to replace them with reading interventionists. Okay, these are individuals that are gonna work hand to hand with kids, teaching them how to read. That's $148,000 for those three positions. Again, not our initiative, but one the state says we have to figure out. All right, this is good news for us all, I think. Strategic plan goal number three, community collaboration and engagement. All of these ideas here are of a zero sum. We intend to start a student advisory committee, a parent advisory committee, and really develop consistent school-based communication. And really that's, I won't go into any greater detail there. All right, our final goal, I'm working towards the end here, is uh, safe and secure uh, buildings. Again, when we initially, and I know we'll talk about this later this evening, uh, it was, you know, our understanding when we crafted this, that, that the, the transition of the accounts payable and um, at that time procurement positions uh, would be a zero sum uh, transfer. Um, and, and again, I know that's on the agenda to discuss this evening, so I'll stop there. Uh, secondly, for safe and secure schools, we would like to implement an alternative education program. Again, the cost here is really for two teachers, one at the middle school, one at the high school. We know suspension doesn't work. We know we don't wanna just kick kids out and, and place them back in environments that probably reinforce some of these negative behaviors that we're seeing at school. We know that they've gotta stay on track academically. So it's always been my opinion as a former school principal, and I'll get loud again, that we do two things when we're trying to discipline students. Number one, we make sure that the environment is one that remains safe. So in other words, are all the students in the school building, are all the staff, can we ensure that they remain safe regardless of what our consequence is for the student uh, that, that has the infraction? And probably number two, and more importantly, we take care of that kid that has the infraction because if we don't, then we're just kicking the can down the road. So this alternative education program is one in my mind that doesn't send that kid home. It makes sure that that kid stays on track academically. And we also in that program begin to infuse some character education uh, so that we don't, we don't continue to tell them that they're doing the wrong things, but we start to tell them what the right things are. Uh, thirdly there, we applied for uh, two school, school security officers. Uh, we, we implemented this program last year at the high school. They work in cooperation with our school uh, resource officers. It's been a wonderful experience at the high school. Those are partially fund, uh, grant funded through state funds, but there is a local match requirement. That's what the local match requirement is for those two positions. And finally, we, we crossed out um, at one time, well, let me back up. A few years ago, the, the county initiated a, 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 a upgrade to their uh, radio program. And it was uh, explained at that time that part of, or I think it was phase two or phase three of that program was going to get all of our school buses up to speed with this new ability to communicate. Better towers, better radios, and so on. I'm sure you guys know much more about it than I do. Uh, prior to the creation of the budget this year, we found that the school division um, was going to end up being $146,000 short uh, on, on uh, the radios that were needed for that program. So again, uh, this wasn't the program, th this kind of landed on our doorstep of, of hey, we need $146,000 in order for the buses now to be implemented uh, with the radios. So uh, when we originally did this, we were thinking, well, you know, that's gotta be part of the budget. We, we don't have that kind of money. We, we did figure out through uh, ESSER funds that we could use ESSER funds, so that, now that is out of the operating request and uh, no longer a conversation in the budget. Additional budget builder requests. So again, in this slide, what I wanna make sure that we know is that the school division is really getting squeezed on, on both ends. Uh, but all of these are great ideas. All of these are great programs. But as you've already seen, the tuition uh, for the lab school is gonna be a new cost. The cost associated with the Virginia Literacy Act, it's a new cost. We do have, and Mr. Collins was on the school board, he certainly knows this. Uh, 
the needs in special education, they always seem to increase the number of students uh, that we find eligible. This, just, this is not in King George, it's, it's really across the country right now. We're estimating that the increase in the students in special education and the needs being $70,000, we have contracted with Mark III for our health care. That's turned out to be a, a very valuable asset to us. That's an additional cost of $17,000. And again, right now, just to do business like we did this school year next year, we believe that the increased cost in utilities and, and fuel costs will, will be uh, associated with those amounts there on the right-hand side. These are the additional staffing requests right now in the entire budget allocation. I've already gone over many of those. I won't go over them again. And then this is the major differences between FY24 and FY25. The first uh, row there is this compensation increase to include the, comp the compression in the pay scale. Uh, health, health insurance premium went up 11%, just as it did in the county as well. Uh, just like the Board of Supervisors, the school board has agreed to pick up that cost. Uh, and then the budget builder request. So this is the stuff. This is the Virginia literacy textbooks and things of that nature. That's an additional $515,000 and the new position requests right now are $718,000 in the total operating budget of the school. Again, this is not uh, strict costs that, that would be seen directly by the Board of Supervisors as, as far as our allocation. Uh, so again, probably the most important thing we're looking at here is this blue column on the, this dark blue column on the far right. And again, we, we're taking a look at state revenue, uh, all of our sources of revenue. And as, as mentioned early on, the total amount is 1.728. Uh, and again, this is, this is one that shows the similar thing broken down by appropriation category. And, and I think this is one that'll, that'll shape our conversation moving forward and again, the, the Formatting is a little bit off, but right now I, I, um, I know we've had a number of conversations over the last week. We've talked a lot about what direction to go in. And this is just simply a, 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 a thought and a, and a humble idea that I think I've heard uh, Mr. Dasavi talk to me a little about and, and a number of uh, other folks on both boards. Currently, if you take a look at this table, you can see that uh, the amounts in the Board of Supervisors draft budget currently is $122,848. Um, if for, for us just to do the 1% one, the 1 and the step, meaning a 3% salary increase, similar to what the county has done, uh, and, and take care of the health care, those things alone, everything else out of the budget, that's new positions out, that's no compression, uh, no compression adjustment and so on. It's a total cost of $600,647. I know we intend to talk about this a little bit, but uh, my finance director estimated the accounts payable position. I think she said something, I think it's a little different than what you may have had Levita, but it was in the same ballpark. It was somewhere around $65,000 is what she estimated it. That would, that would be a total of uh, $666,309. And then really, I, I think, um, you know, from, from, from this bullet to this bullet, this is total budget request of, of $1.7 million. But I think some of these uh, points are, are kind of milestones that are worth discussing uh, as we move forward. I can stop there, Mr. Chair. Mr. Bush, do you want to... Of that direction. Sorry, right, we've heard this presentation several times. I think it. We will make comments, but I think we best to start with the board of supervisors because we've heard this presentation. So it might be valuable to hear from the board of supervisors before us. Davis was saying that we haven't heard your comments. So right. Uh, so I have to hear. Back on oh. you might discuss it a thousand times, but okay. that's part of the issue. I think it would be kind of included in our thoughts. You want to say, Mr. Will? Yeah, yeah, we've had you have a good point. Um, I think, um, Mr. Davis, um, we have discussed this many times. Um, I know you haven't heard that discussion, is what your point is. I understand that, 
But it's like um, we would just be reviewing a lot of what he says, but we can make and see if we have any comments. I think we might have some response comments that we would hear from you, but I don't mind um, if, um, Board, what do you think? You want to go ahead and make a comment about telling Mr. Frank about the presentation? I don't have any comments for the first first round. Next round, I'll probably. Ms. Davis? I don't have comments yet, but is there any specific question that you might want us to expound on? No, it's coming. Okay, it's coming. <laughs> I'm Ms. Uber. I don't have anything else to say. Mr. Rolls. Yeah, we better see if any birth by this first on the time. Um, just a brief comment on, on my part. I'll say that um, we've done a tremendous amount of work on this, and sometimes some of the uh, some of the things that uh, Dr. Boyd presented can sound a, a little confusing, uh, possibly, but I can tell you that. Um, the, the total budget that was presented is something I think that will, let me say this, I believe that we continue, I continue to get emails and so on from teachers and staff members saying thank you, thank you, thank you, especially in regards to the insurance and to the increase in salary. Um, and it's nice to be able to say we're presenting a budget that basically the entire school division is collaborating together on. Um, I, you know, you can get into all kinds of specifics, but until we hear what questions you might have, I mean, I can, you could go on for an hour going through some of the same stuff that Dr. Boyd did, but I can tell you that that is generally the feeling that we have presented a collaborative uh, budget that um, the entire division uh, is happy with. Okay, then we'll come back to the Board of Supervisors, Mr. Sullivan. I do have one question. Um, you close out your slide. No, all right, I think we're good now. <laughs> so we close out the slide deck with uh, the total ask is 1.7 million seven in, in change, um, but that's not really the total ask. Um, that's just the delta between what was originally agreed to by Mr. Rizavi. What is the actual full number that you're asking the county for? Is asking the the whole six budget. million, whatever the exact saying we're just number. asking for 1.7 million makes that sound really, really cheap. What are you really looking for? So basically, twenty six million and tiny bit of change. Okay, Mr. Strauss. Yes, sir. So, uh, regarding your comments, Mr. Bush, the uh, about the teachers and stuff calling you and thanking you for sticking up for a salary, I, I can't imagine anybody not being happy about that. So, uh, no, no citizens called me and thanked me for raising their taxes, though. So, a um, couple questions, Dr. Boyd. Uh, did I hear you say that the amount of funding the state provides is tied to the real estate property taxes? Correct. Partially. Partially. Did the amount values, was value total assessed value? Okay. Right. The total assessed value. So that means that during the last assessment, the values went up 100, 150% or some other, which, uh, means the property assessments, the real estate values went up. Did that affect the funding that we received? Actually, in this, I'm gonna go back to that slide. So in the 2022-2024 biennial, our composite index was 
it's 0.3805, we'll say 38%, meaning that the, that the locality uh, ideally, and I can tell you that every, every locality uh, pays more for education than the local composite index. Nevertheless, the, uh, to your question, the, the locality was responsible for 38% of the request in uh, 2022, 2024. It actually went down, meaning that the county uh, is responsible for less of the operating budget this year. So uh, to your point, I know that the real estate values went up. However, this is also a calculation of where King George County is in comparison to the 131 other localities and they just put us in rank order. And, and actually this time around, the local composite index is more favorable for, for King George County than it was two years ago. Okay. The other question I have uh, goes back to the slide. Let's try and get a number here. Uh, probably, I don't see a number on it, but it's the one that's got the timeline across the top. Uh, uh, so at the beginning, at the end, at the end. Okay. So because I right have, so what I'm trying to figure out is that that second part there. So the 1% step salary increase and healthcare increase. Yes, sir. So does that mean, and, and the first bullet says amount and board of supervisors draft budget. So a failure to plan is a plan to fail. Does that mean that there was no step increase originally included in the draft budget? No, it was included. So this is an additional step increase. No, this from the original uh, budget, it was a 1% salary increase and a step. Our step is 2%. Does that make sense? So that was, that was in the budget from step one. Even, even with the government, even... But let me help Mr. Scott. The budget, there was original budget that the governor proposed. So all school systems start with that. That's never the final answer. Then the legislature, the House and the Senate get together and they come up with their version and then it's compromise and so forth. And so the budget that's approved by the legislature is over a million dollars more than what the governor proposed. So they're getting more money than what the governor proposed. Uh, I think it's a million, a little over a million dollars uh, more. Uh, so, so that brought that to there. That reduced their amount to the 122 was the additional local share that the superintendent brought me at that time. But he's brought me three copies now, so we just keep moving along because of the error that was made. And I think it was double counting, is that what happens uh, in the budget? And so uh, so that had to be adjusted where I think it was noted in one of the earlier slides. And so basically what they're asking for now is, okay, that's what we have in the budget is an increase in the local share. But they're asking if you would consider those other three options ranging from, I guess, a, a minimal to the maximum of fulfilling the entire uh, request. That, that's a good explanation, sir. Thank you. That helps a lot. Those are options that are, that are up there. Yes, sir. And so in, in the, like, if, if we didn't do anything to the right, what's the increase that they get? What's okay, the so let's, get? so, if if we are here right now, we we would it, it's it's a tough question to answer because the answer is none. The answer is zero salary increase, or we take the local money, we provide the salary increase, and we cut people in programs. So right now, in order for us, which is why I, I make these milestones because. Uh, right here is, I think, th the number that's going to get us the salary increase and the health care without anything else in the operating budget. And it's it's probably the number 
where we don't have to cut people in programs if we want to provide a salary increase. I, uh, that's right here. The 600, the six, the 666 is the inclusion of the accounts payable position. So, I mean, we can set that aside for right now. This, this number here is the number needed in order to, to provide the salary increase, the health, the health care, and nothing else. Dr. Boyd, can I ask you another question? I've had a couple of, I guess they were teachers or somebody from the school system called me. And in the approved budget for the legislature for each year of the biennium, it says the money that is provided is for a 3% raise. And I know you and I had a conversation, but I guess it's confusing when you say 1% from the governor's budget. It is a little bit confusing. I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm not sure some of your employees necessarily understand that. So that, that's why we're making our way around and, and speaking with folks, and, and, and it's a little confusing. The step in our salary scales from one step to the next is an increase of 2%. So if we cre increase the salary scale by 1% across the board and you teach this year and you turn around and you teach again next year, your salary in essence will go up 3%. It's the... Okay, so you have a salary increase, like essentially a raise, but the step is a tenure. Yeah, correct. It's, it's kind of like looking at it like tenure or, or um, years of experience. So our salary scales go from step 1 to 37. Those most often correspond with the number of years that you've been teaching. So first year you're making $50,000, year after that is 2% uh, more, if, if there's no raise at all. So if we take the step into consideration and provide a 1% salary increase, every, all of our employees receive the 3% salary increase that's suggested by the General Assembly. Does that only apply to teachers or does that apply to everyone? That, that applies across the board. Okay. Um, Ms. Pedro. Ms. Pedro. Yes. Uh, quick question. So the original budget you were going for was twenty-four million, correct? Was the original? I, I believe that might have been what it was. It, it was uh, our current allocation plus the one hundred and twenty-two thousand dollars. Okay. So, so for clarification, so how did it jump from twenty-four to twenty-six? Again, so that's that's when the finance department recognized the the calc tool error, the the error that was made in the calc tool that she made that she made in the calc tool. So that added two million. Yeah. So the federal revenue that we receive is one point. It's almost exactly the same. It's one point seven million. Without getting too too much in the weeds, that amount of money was applied to revenue. So as Levita was pointing out, it's almost like it was applied twice. Okay, and then for Levita, if if we funded the twenty six million, how much is that out of the looking at a dollar bill? How much is that out of our budget? Um, I didn't calculate it based on the dollar bill, but if we funded at twenty six million, we have to add an additional one point six million, probably out of our fund balance or however you all decide to proceed, which will bring our um, the usage of our fund balance up to uh, three point four million that we would use to balance the budget. And that would be sort of in the 55%, 56 maybe percent of that the schools would, their budget takes of the dollar. That's where it comes yeah. to the dollar. I always like that dollar analogy. Yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, Dr. Ford. So how many positions are SOQ out of the 715? How many are SOQ out of the 715? So if we go back, So Boyd, yeah, I'll explain what SOQ okay. is. I know you're going to ask. So SOQ is a document that's created by the state. It stands for Standards of Quality, and it's a prescriptive document that the state creates telling school divisions how many positions they need to have in particular areas. So for example, how many teachers, how many administrators, how many counselors, and so on. I don't mind saying that the SOQ is exactly what the JLARC study found to be outdated. Uh, every school division in the state of Virginia hires or, or uh, staffs more people than the SOQ prescribes, which at this point the state has said, yeah, we, we know that it's, it's, it's not effective. So of the, of the uh, positions here, 
that our SOQ uh, school counselor, as I mentioned, is an SOQ position. Uh, FTE teachers Dr. are- Dr. Boyd, so my question was, out of the 715, how many are SOQ? Oh, maybe half. I don't have the number in front of me. So about 350? Uh, but that's, I don't quote me on that because that's, like I said, it's, it's not accurate. So that's based on hundred percent of 350. Yes. I follow you. And, and then the County, um, funds the other 350. Got it. hundred percent. I follow you. Okay. So, so what, Mr. would you mind, do you want me to explain what you're saying? I don't know that everybody. I, I, I understand what I'm saying. I know, but I'm not sure that. Well, you explained the SOQ. There's a quality. Right. Um, I'll, I'll just double back on it. So it says that for every so many kids, you need a teacher for every so many kids, you need a principal for every so many kids, you need a counselor for every so many kids, you need whatever it is. And that's what the state pays for hundred percent. And then the locality picks up any additional. So the state says we need about 350 as opposed to 715, right? So we're picking up 350 positions. So in 2020, <clears throat> there were 605 positions. 600, when I left the board. Oh, I can't confirm that, I'm not sure. So in six, other words- There were 605 employees for the school. So now there's 715. So that's 115 employees in four years. We haven't had 115 people in four years addition on top of that. Well, I'm looking at the numbers. And so we, the Board of Supervisors continually to fund uh, positions. Sure that you all decide what positions they are and you ask us for the money to fund them, and we do. And some of them are filled and some of them are not. How many non-filled positions do you have now? How many non-filled we have filled? Well, you don't have to come up because it's on tape and you can't hear anybody in the audience. Okay. And we want to make sure everybody hears it. This year, we have 28 and a half openings, 16 and a half, which are professional, 12 are support. Okay. Thank but you. we still have to have people fill and do those jobs of 10 and a half people. Well. It's eight and a half teachers and two counselors. We have to have people doing those jobs every day. We have them filled with long-term subs, which cost money. We have two counselors with long-term subs. Okay, I've got lots of numbers. Okay, well, let me finish my dialogue. So you have 28 non-filled positions. What's the value of that? In other words, in money. We can get that. I don't have that right off the top of my head, but we're also paying teachers at the high school to cover extra blocks. So, so I don't mean to interrupt, but I understand all those things. If you have paraprofessionals sometimes doing teacher jobs, and sometimes you have teachers taking on additional responsibilities and getting a stipend or doing the additional job. My question was still the same, but you don't have an answer. How much is the 28 jobs cost? Are you looking for the fund balance at the end of the year? No. Well, if you don't have 28 people doing the job, there's a certain amount of money that is in the budget for those 28 people. Yeah, but they're not vacancies in the sense that nobody's doing the job. It's just not a licensed person doing the job. Right. But so there's a, there's a a difference between a licensed person and a non-licensed person. Correct. And there's a large amount of money. A lot of times they call it breakage. Okay. So it, in my guesstimate, it would be in the $600,000 range. That's no guesstimate. 
Um, so the utilities, you're asking $56,000 more when the performance pay, uh, agreement was supposed to be zero for 20 years. So I still don't understand how we keep paying more for utilities when it was supposed to be zero for 20 years. That's just, that's a comment, because every year you're asking for more money for utilities. Um, and it's just, there's, there's either the performance plan that the county agreed upon was faulty, or there's something else going on. Um, the sizes. You know how I feel about stipends. I'm looking right at you. So the stipends are what you, they, you give people money to do coaching and tutoring and lead teacher. And you give stipends for almost anything. When I was on the school board, I was not a fan of these stipends because they have grown. So to say they haven't grown in 20 years is not an accurate statement because I was on the board when we raised them. So I just want to make sure that's clear. So, but you, these stipends are out of control. I know I'll probably get a lot of email on this, but they are. I mean, you get a stipend, Mr. Bush, you get a stipend for everything. Just, I know, I'll just stop right there before I get yeah, if if, you, but, if you or the board wants to see a list of the stipends, I'm happy to oh, show I, you. I've seen the stipends, yeah. and it's just it's amazing what people get paid for. Extra. So let's talk about compression. So when I was on the board, we asked the board of supervisors to fix the compression. And they did. Eight million dollars to fix the compression. And we were told, the school board said, and I was one of them, that we would never come back again because we fixed it now. But it's obviously not fixed. Hmm. So it, the, the Board of Supervisors has an Ms. Cobb, do you have the numbers for each year increase of the school board budget for the last five years? Not for the actual budget, not for the request, but we do have a 10-year look back for funds returned. Okay, we'll get to that in a minute. Um, so every year that I was on the board, which was eight of them, they got a 3% raise every year, at least, minimum. And in some years they got, some people got a, a lot because they were doing the compression and all that, and they got a big raise. And since my two years on the Board of Supervisors, they've at least gotten a 3% raise, at least. So that's um, eight, 10 years of consistent raises. Even in the bad times, that was the number one priority for the school board when I was on it, was uh, paying for the folks. The bus drivers um, brought those up to a, a workable rate, wage. Um, that was a long time coming. So um, It coming back. Okay. So, what I am saying to you and trying to understand is how we got back in a bind because it was fixed. So, is that, is that a question? I, I can't really confirm some of the facts that you mentioned. Uh, and certainly would love to sit down with you and go back to all the way to the minutes that, that you served on the board. Uh, all I can tell you is, is some of the things that um, I could probably address on the fly is 
so the, 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 hold let, me, on. let me just ask one question okay. before you go on the fly. Um, so how many increase of students has it been in the last 10 years? How many what? ADM, what's been the increase? It's been I, pretty consistent, right? Well, yeah, roughly. So when, it, when I started here, which was 10 years ago, and I always use this number, the high school enrollment was 1,234. It was one, two, three, four. That's why I remember it. That's why I can tell it to you on the fly. Right now, the high school enrollment is over 1,500. Okay, so but the ADM for all the schools has been pretty consistent. 2015 plus, plus, minus, right? But we've had to, um, the Board of Supervisors had to continually funding. Mm-hmm. So when you took it, look at the per, per pupil rate from 10 years ago to now, because the ADM is pretty much the same, it's an incredible amount of money that the Board of Supervisors has um, given to the schools, which are about like 52% of our budget, Wasabi. So, we were under the impression that so this million dollar mistake um, is, is very problematic. And I guess my suggestion would be to see where you're at in mid-year with, with um, breakage and all the other type of um, things that happen. And Ms. Cobb was talking about the non-spent money, to kind of hold on that and see where it come up in the half a year and then come back to us and see where you're really at and see what we really need to do. If that, would, would you all agree that that would be a fair way to do things? How do you hire more employees and not know that you're gonna be able to afford them? Well, you already have openings. So um, every year is the same. Um, you have you never hire the amount of employees that you have budgeted for. No, but we do have people doing those jobs because we have to have enough uh, students to teach a race here. So we still we do have people performing those jobs, just not as placement teachers. Well, what I'm telling you is, is that there's a, if you hired a teacher for someone who's doing a paraprofessional job, you budget at the, at the teacher's rate, not the paraprofessional rate. So that means the budget would still be whole for that position. But in the meantime, while you have a paraprofessional in there, there is a, a gap. There's a amount of money that's too good. So I'm saying when you get to mid-year, see where you're at and see a little more realistically. So last year, Ms. Cobb, it was $700,000 uh, give back. $500,000. So what's, what's the average over five years? The average? About a million dollars a year. Over ten years. Over ten years. Yeah. So that's you're you're so you're included COVID in there, and you're included when we couldn't hire teachers. Okay, so there's going to be a, a large amount of money. Let's that just we go give back last year. Right. So 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 that's seven hundred. Last year was five hundred. Five hundred thousand. So you take the five hundred thousand dollars. Mid year, see where you're at. Five hundred thousand doing the things that you want to do. Then see where your breakage is. And then if there's um, a need that we could fund at that time, because we'll see where our budget's at at that time. You see what I'm saying? I think it's a solution. Can, can I follow that? Hopefully, can you go back to my presentation? Whoever has a control? Well, I can, can I mention one quick, one quick thing about stipend? You know, having been a high school principal actually longer, longer than Jesse has all over the world with five different schools, 
I can tell you the stipends. I just looked at the one in Texas, 2013 middle school basketball. Just to give an example at a school that is larger than us, but not that much. They paid $1,842. Ten years later, they're $2,500. Um, the football went from $1,500 to $4,000 middle school, and just to kind of keep apples to apples. When I was a high school principal, it was a little bit small, actually it was a little smaller than this one. The middle school got, I believe, it was 800 and some dollars back in 2011, and now they're getting $1,800. All I'm saying is stipends do increase, and um, actually I was surprised our stipends here were so low. I agree, I'm, you know, we're comparing it to Texas, but schools and similar size stipends should have gone up um, considerably. And most all the schools I've been associated with, they have. I know that's a small amount, but I just wanted to correct you in that when I looked at the stipends, I, was, I told Dr. Boyd, I said, wow, and, you know, we paid more in a Christian school when we could hardly afford anything in stipends than we were paying here in public school. And then also in my last school, which was a public school, a little smaller than this one, I was a high school principal, we paid more than, than we paid here. So uh, th there's so many points that were made there that I really just don't even know how to attack. So you, you, I think you made this point that we hired 115 additional staff in the last four years. So we-, we, we My number of 605 is correct. Okay. We didn't hire any new staff positions last year through the budget process at all until later on we hired one. And then this year we haven't hired any yet. So within two years, if your number is correct, in two years, I get this would have been the end of Dr. Benson's tenure. We would have hired 115 people in two years. I just don't know how that all adds up. Um, currently, we occupy 52 cents on the dollar. There's a lot to that equation. That's not just a factor of the number of dollars that the school division requests. It's a total function of the economic health of the county, right? So depending, the percentage that the school division uses is, is a direct function of how much money the county has collectively to spend on those services. And I know that, and, and again, that's what we went into this budget process saying is that I, you know, I can take an appreciation of where we are as a county and let's try to craft the budget accordingly. But, but that's certainly part of that function. You made another point about the number of students that we have per pupil expenditure and how much our employees cost based on that. There's so much more that goes into that equation. We just showed that the Virginia Literacy Act is an unfunded mandate. You made the, so in other words, that doesn't have anything to do with extra people. That's the state saying you are going to do this and you're going to spend this money. And so, so are you taking what it said you're taking the reading specialist and put them in that job, right? We have to. Okay, so why would that cost more money? Because to re what we have to do according to the Virginia Literacy Act is replace the re so to be more specific, we have to take the reading specialists and move them into coaching roles, meaning that they're now responsible for teaching our teachers how to teach reading. We will no longer have the reading specialist working with students. So we have to replace the services that they were, that, you know, the services they were providing to students with basically paraprofessionals. So that, that's the idea there. Back to your, your initial point on the front end was about SOQ positions. And I want to make sure everybody understands that. And, and it's an important one that local governments need to appreciate because this this will happen as long as this funding model is in place. When the local government, or excuse me, when the General Assembly or the governor or whoever says there's going to be a 3% salary increase, what they're saying to school divisions is that we will cover that amount for all of your SOQ positions. This is what Mr. Collins was pointing out. So he's saying every position that we have that's SOQ prescribed, the state will provide that 3%. Now, with that 3%, the state also says, locality, you have to come up with a, a different, you have to match that, and it changes. It changes what they require to match that at. But typically what that does, not just here in King George, but everywhere, 
is as the General Assembly is saying, hey, we got 3% raises for teachers or we got 3% raises for county employees, what it's really done is the same thing it's done with the school division for the Virginia Literacy Act. It puts you in a bind because you're then on the hook for trying to figure out how to make up that difference for the employees that are not SOQ covered. Does that make sense? So that that's where the bind is every year. That's where it'll be next year when I come back again. Uh, in, in school divisions, every year they're going to cut, they're going to say, here's your raise, and we're going to turn around and say, well, we've got to pick up a difference. That's where we are now. So, Dr. It, Boyd, yes. So not only are you picking up the 3% the General Assembly has given the SOQ, which is only half the employees, you're picking up 3% for all the other employees and their salary. 3% and their salary. Right. So we, the state funds a certain amount of SOQs. We figured it was about half of those 715. Or you know, let's say it's even three quarters. And the county pays the other quarter or 50% employees their full salary plus 3%. Okay. Because you, you, if we don't pay them that, the FOQ employees will not get the 3%. Correct. Right. So, so in other words, there's the strings tied to that money. Like right now, if, if we don't do what we're requested to do from the General Assembly to match that 3% compensation increase, I think right now, if you look in the calc tool, I, I want to say it's somewhere in the ballpark of $700,000 for the compensation increase. Is that what it says? I want to say it's seven something. Well, seven for the current year, uh, the state is putting up 695000 and the match for the locality is 396. Okay, so in other words, that goes up next year size. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So that's kind of what we're talking about in, in, in the number in number form. If we are fortunate enough to be able to provide the three percent raise for SOQ positions, then we're on the hook for a certain amount for the other positions. And again, that's going to be the case every year going forward. So can you go back to the presentation, Mr. Dines? I think this is what you were talking about as you, as you finished your point is, and, and this is a possible option. So right now, if ideally, I, I, the, to me, if we have to, if, if we can't get here somehow, some way, fund balance or, or uh, carryover funds or whatever it is, this in our operating budget right now is the point where we are looking at people in positions and saying, we no longer have a CTE program. We no longer have some of the last pro some of the last programs in. Dr. Boyd. Ms. Collins, would you I, I, I have to count 10 seconds before I speak. So the to say that you're going to cut positions, I, I can't believe that. I, I can't believe it. It's, it's, a, it's a scare tactic for the board, and I can take that as a very effective. Okay. All right. I don't mind. I don't mind walking you through. And, and again, this is in my mind. If you want to correct me in, in any way, feel free to do so. In order for us to take the money from the state for the compensation increase. In order for us to say, we want the state money for the compensation increase. And just to do the compensation increase and the health care increase, similar to the same thing that you guys did here on the county level. It's going to cost the school division or whoever $600,000. So right now, I need to take that $24 million. Let's say there, you guys aren't even part of it. Okay? At this point, let's say we don't do anything. And we go back to the number that you, you afforded us. All of the programs, everything that we have in this county right now, next year is going to be $122,000 more than this. Without any assistance from the Board of Supervisors, I've got to find $600,000 in this sum in order to make the, to take the money from the state for the salaries and to cover the health care. 
So if okay, hold on, man. yes, make sure I understand. You guys are giving back five hundred thousand this year, right? That was last year. Okay. Yeah, we don't know this year. It's always so. Oh, that's a good question, though. Every year, it's usually not until August time frame where we know what fund balance is left over. So let me, if I could go back to this last slide again, if you look at these star bullets. Mm -hmm. I appreciate it, but we want to get some more questions in. Okay. Well, this is, a, this is two statements. One is, one is understanding the JLARC study, and I know in my conversations at the state level, we talk all the time about how the way it's set up in Virginia is is bad because these SOQ positions, you know, they say you have to do this, this, and this, but we're not going to fund everything, and the locality is is on the hook for it. And some of the localities that have had a lot of growth, like there's a couple of areas out in the western mountains because of retirees coming in in COVID, they don't have the income, but they got some nice retirees that are buying property on Smith Lake. So it elevates the numbers and it makes a lot of localities struggle sometimes to cover these mandated positions, especially when we add more positions. So that is concerning and I wish at the state level we correct that. But I have to at least give, um, uh, I don't want to say a shut up, but being a coach for a very long time and the last time I coached in King George was 2016, they get the same salary as I had back then as a coach. And so I know as a coach, I think sometimes I, my husband calculated it, that I made a penny, you know, so I can see why you put in a lot of time as a coach. So I know that's different than some of my colleagues, but I understand being in that position. That is a lot. Mr. Collins, could you yeah, have, yeah. Sorry. I'm sorry. Well, you guys have been through. Can we have one more question from this board? All right. Mr. Allen. Yes, sir. So, uh, Mr. Sellers, he had mentioned about the unspent funds. And, yeah, I just want to caution that, you know, I don't want people to hear because oftentimes when they hear, oh, there's unspent money, the people are going to go, well, next year we've got to spend it all or we don't spend it all. I don't want people to hear that because, you know, you need to, you need to spend the money wisely. And if you're not going to spend it, then that doesn't mean that they need to go buy something they don't need. So I don't want people to take it the wrong way. Um, you know, there's, if you didn't spend all your money in somewhere, somebody did something right, maybe. So, um, but with that, I was looking at the, I'm, I'm kind of curious, and uh, I was trying to Google while I was sitting here, but if it's 3%, the state increased 3%, then my question is, if we went back a year or two years, did the board not estimate that, guess what, the next three years, we expect 3% increase a year and plan for that in the budget? Like, why is it a surprise? And why now are we being asked to come up with the money to make up the difference in that 3%? Like, like it's a surprise. I mean, it, you know, it, it it is. A, it's usually a surprise. Uh, it, it usually comes from the General Assembly, literally two three weeks ago of of what they what they proposed last year. It, it was um, it, it changed pretty ra drastically last year. It was a five percent, and then it was going to be a seven percent, and then it was that that's it's it's that way every year. But but so I, I did. In my Google, it says that it's anticipating an additional 7% in 26, 27. In, in this brand, two bills require the state to increase salaries by 3% for 25, 26 school year and by an additional 7% in 26, 27. So, I mean, granted, that was just one Google. There's probably a lot more there. <laughs> so somewhere in like the budgets for the out years, if, if I were doing the budget, I would say, you know what? Understanding there's an average increase over the last five years of 3%. I'm going to plan in my next budget, 3%, 3%, 3%. And at least it's not going to be drastic. Even if it's a little more or a little less, it's not going to be as drastic. Well, we, we can do that. It's just that, you know, the state determines, you know, how much it's going to be. Let's just say over the last three years, it was we planned and said, well, it's going to be 4% as the average. Well, it's still the state is only going to give us like this year just the 3%, and then the county has to still partner with that. 
So it doesn't, you know, I, what you say is valuable, but it still doesn't change the fact that the state is going to give us a portion of it and then the county has to come alongside that. But so one of the reasons we're here is because of the, the million dollar mistake. So I, I don't know how to reconcile that. Can we, can we, our board have some comments now? Yes, sir. All right, thank you. Yeah, let's start with Mr. Rolls. I'll just say that we already sent in a pretty shoestring budget given the fact that you've all, and when we go to shop, you know the situation is pretty, pretty rough right now. So the fact that we came in here only proposing 1% raise that is a pay cut for our employees compared to inflation. And also, we can't necessarily just keep up with inflation because we don't have the money printer. We only have that up, you know, now it's not So we have to obviously stay in line with what we can do with generally the economy supporting. But I think 1% is it's really nothing that's in an already with a very low ball of budget on account of that. You mentioned the million dollar mistake. Let me be very clear that that sounded just somebody lost a million dollars. We thought that the federal government would give a million dollars more, 1.7 more than they are. I mean, it was a mistake on paper. So, but the total cost that we in our budget is paid the same that, that we're asking for. But yeah, I'll go back to this. You think that uh, other things were said. I'll, I'll mention stipends. And looking at those, my overall impression is just how tiny they are for the amount of time that coaches and you know, your directors are spending to get that money. It's, I mean, it's almost laughable. So it's, I mean, they're obviously just very dedicated, don't spend their time because they care about the kids, why they do it, not for the money. If they're looking at the money, they, they wouldn't be doing, doing what they're doing. And then look at the compression. We mentioned the 0.75% raises in year six to 10. But then I went and looked at the teacher's salary. It looks like even like a few of those early ones that are so small, it's like less than 1%. So they're, it's, it's the problems even worse than year six to 10. So it is something important to address. Um, and then also, I guess the point about we did a 1% COLA, but there's some stuff in pieces too. But the stuff increases are really just supposed to be pay increases for their uh, increased uh, contribution as they get more experience and time the job. Now we, we have a problem where I don't have the number grant in front of me, but if you look at the number of teachers that we have, just looking at teachers right now, uh, at various levels of experience, we have a lot of teachers with four years or less. But then after four years, there's just there's like a, like a super big drop. It's like a cliff. So we're losing a lot of, we train time to train teachers in the first four years, and we lose a lot of them. So it's, it's a problem. I think addressing suppression in the pay scale would help with that a lot. Find some efficiencies there. I think I'll ask you one question, Dr. Boyd. Uh, so you look at the different options you presented for us. All but the, the last one talks about no new positions. So, so we have positions that are legally required by the Literacy Act. So, yeah, How can we address that? And that? again, that would be us having to look inward towards our budget and try to figure it out ourselves. So this is no new money tied to new positions. So we would have to take a look at some of those vacant positions and see what we could do to adjust some things and, and take a look at uh, attrition and, uh, as Mr. Collins pointed out, break it, breakage and things of that nature. But again, so I, I would say to me, you know, Obviously, you know, we want to move the school division forward and, and that it, that does come at a, a steep cost for the county. And, and I know that we may not be at that point right now. If you work your way back down this number line, these numbers here are the numbers that we probably need in order just to maintain the status quo so that we can look back at our teachers and say, we want to give you the same raise that every surrounding school division is going to receive. We want to give you the same raise that county employees are going to receive. We want to give you the same consideration with health care uh, that, that we're hearing and seeing elsewhere. 
I, I think absent of that, then it, it's it, it, we we will regress as a school division. Um, and and I just want to we've kind of hinted at this this option down here that I, I kind of want to spell out a little bit more towards the bottom, the bottom bullets. If we can agree on a number, and again, preferably somewhere uh, between this, in my in my humble opinion, 666 and the one point, if we could agree on a number somewhere there, and we could request the use of the Board of Supervisors fund balance. I know I, I, know I watched the meeting the other night. That's out at about a $40 million sum. I know that some of that is already um, somewhere in the ballpark of 27 million, I know we can't touch. Uh, however, you know, we're talking about somewhere between 600,000 and, and, and uh, a million plus. If we could access those funds on the front end and then moving forward, allow the school board to carry over unused funds. This is a practice that Mr. Rasavi and I have talked about a few times. Many school divisions do it already. And to Mr. Stroud's point, what that does is that makes us responsible stewards for our money. It's not like in the 11th hour, everyone's thinking in, in some government worlds, spend, 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 or else we don't get it next year. Allow us to carry over our funds. However, this year, um, whatever number we could agree on between this 666 and, and 1.7, in August, when we find out what our carryover funds for the school division are, we just turn those. We just turn all of that money back into the board of supervisors to make up the difference for the ad added request to our operating budget. So, in other words, it's on the front end, allowing us to receive the money from the fund balance so that we can responsibly make decisions about raises or health care, not where we have to consider it halfway through the year. And then at the end of the fiscal year, any money that is left over in the fund balance, and as Ms. Cobb has pointed out, you know, that can be $500,000 up to a million dollars typically. Moving forward, allow the school board to carry over those unused funds. But at the end of this fiscal year, FY24, we turn all those, those funds back into the county to make up the difference for the request on the front end. So again, this is more not this is more like a a loan versus, you know, adding you know, adding to the bottom line. So just a uh, suggestion. Two questions. One from Ms. Wait, Stroud, wait, wait, one from Mr. Davis. Then Mr. Collins, I don't think um, Mr. Rolls has finished yet, oh. if you don't mind. And then we want to go through our people if it's okay. He's, when he's finished, you had a question for Mr. Rolls? Is that what you're saying? So much of it's quick based on what you said already. So uh, Mr. Rolls, is that okay with you? Yes, sir. Sure. So, number one, I, I kind of, I'm kind of taken back because just overall how the board two guys being painted here. That you, you do guys understand that the budget that was given to us, we approved it to the penny. We didn't take anything away, but that's not how it's being painted. Okay, so I, I'm a little bit, I'm not happy with that because if you're making it look like we, you guys are going to cut you your salaries, and that's just not the case. You know, we gave you exactly what you asked for. My impression, though, of the $1.7 million was not money that you thought you were going to be getting, but the money was counted twice by accident. So I don't, I don't think that, that that part is not correct in saying that we thought we were going to get this money, we, and so we put in there thinking we were going to get it. I think it was counted twice. So it, that, that's a bit of a confusing thing because both of those sums are $1.7 million. The $1.7 million was the federal amount that was misplaced twice. It right. is. And it just so happens that it's $1.7 million for the asking amount, right. too. So it's it's a bit confusing that it both But, that, but that's the clarity point, though. It's, it's not money that you thought you were getting. It's money that was counted twice by on accident. It, 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 what I'm, that's right. Well, right. Yeah. I, I think it is. You, I think you it's, didn't think you were getting it's kind of both. $1.4 million. Well, you're getting $1.7, and it got counted. Well, I, okay. I think I'm, I'm just trying to get clarity on that. Yeah, right, I understand. Effort. I think what part of the, at least from my point of view, it's just me, is that, okay, we present, and as we went through the budget, we're looking at just simply what we need to operate. Forget for a minute us receiving any funds. Uh, and I know you always have to look at how much money is coming in, but a lot of times schools say, okay, what is our need? What do we actually need? We came up with an expense, call it expensive. We came up, this is going to be our expenses for next year. And it's like, okay, 
Now, at the whole time, we were looking about what we thought was going to be received by the state and by the county. But this over here to the right, the expenses, that budget really has not changed. I think that's the point we're trying to make is in our mind, the budget hasn't changed. The amount of money we thought was coming in has changed, but that didn't change this at all. And it still doesn't. We still have the same needs we did regardless of what's coming in or not. Yes, it was a terrible mistake that was made, but we, whether that mistake was there or not there, this over here, what we need our expenses for next year, that hasn't changed from the very first time we started talking about it until we came up with the final budget we approved. It's the amount we received, and you're right, that was a mistake. It's a coincidental that it's 1.7, uh, but you see what I'm saying? It's true, this over here hasn't changed. Yeah, I, 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 I understand that, sir, thank you very much. I was just basically pointing out that the money was counted twice, that you never, there wasn't a thinking that you were gonna get that money and you made the mistake. The mistake was it got counted twice. Right, so you do the math. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, that, that's, that's, that's kind of a difference for me. And, and my next question, I'm sorry, Matt, is um, what was the raise for the teachers last year? 10%. All right. As far as stipends, they're like coaches in middle school football. They paid me $1,200 for about five months. And um, I, did, I, I did it because I loved it. That's right. Yeah. And I'd be there doing it right now for free. So, and the biggest people who made the biggest impression on my life were my coaches, and they did it because they loved it. And I understand we're, playing, we're in a day and age now where people who play pianos and, and want to worship at church not be paid to serve. But that's just, you know, I, I, that's unfortunate for me. But I did it because I loved it. And I would still do it for free. Just like a little league coach does it for free. And they just go there and spend their time and their own money. So I feel you. But I'm also understanding that there's, a, that there's a love that people have. And that the people who are doing it for the love aren't concerned about the money. It really is not. And if they are, then you probably need to find a different coach. Just simply paying people for what they're worth. You're right. A lot of people will do it no matter what. Um, but it's obviously you want to value what they do. Okay, Mr. Rolls, would you go ahead? Yeah, it's a logistically trying to do something halfway through the year. It seems like it'd be a real mess. We have to, like, as Mrs. Uh, Ms. Hoover pointed out, we have to make decisions now. We can't do that with money that we don't know about. And um, I agree with you, Mr. Stroud. I'm glad that we have a system here where we're not just. You got money, we got to spend it so we don't lose it. So, I mean, Google, we don't have a system like that. Uh, so, but we do, it's not money lost at the end of the year, of course. We do just get it back. And and it's important that we have a pad with the, the system we have. If you don't have a pad, you overspend. Like, for instance, we're saying we saved a million dollars on average past 10 years. Last year, we only saved half a million. So, if we planned on having a million left over and spend it, it came up $500,000 short. People, Lose their jobs and or go to jail. So I mean, we have to do that. It's just how it has to work. Uh, but you know, finally, I think you all know that I'm we're all the same um, from the same well, same side here. We're all trying to give the best value to the taxpayers that we can. Now I want to stop on trying to find efficiencies in some of the healthcare and but so there's certain ways to do it that it's for more efficient so we're not wasting money. But um, but we still obviously all want to have good schools and get the best we can do for our students and take good care of our employees. Um, so I hope you come together here and figure that out. But I think we already did our best to really just give you a really uh, low uh, ask for the budget this year. Thank you, Mr. Rawls. Ms. Hoover? Mr. Davis, you had asked about last year's increase being 7%. Um, the surrounding counties also gave the same amount, and we were looking at losing employees if we didn't at least become competitive with them. So that was also a phenomenal year in terms of inflation. Um, and then the other question I had, Mr. Rosati, how many total county employees are there? I think these are about 250 or? Yeah. 250? Is it 250 or 215? And we yeah. have 715 also county employees, right? So for us to have 52% of the budget doesn't seem too extreme in terms of numbers, right? Well, but first of all, when you're talking about 52%, that's just of the local share. That's not mm -hmm. county the state fund. Okay. Um, okay, thank you. That's all. Can I, Mr. Bush, let me just clarify everything first. 
The state law requires any funds that are unextended to revert back to the general fund. So those numbers that Levita put together for us, those monies are part of the general fund balance that come back from the local share that one spent. That's required by state law. But the county could let the school use that money if they wish. Okay, I just wanted to make sure there's there's two sides to that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Misavi. That's important. Frustrating, to be honest. But anyways, you know, we're here because the budget was already passed. The same budget that we're asking for the money for today has already passed. So we know that you guys already approved it. We made a mistake on our end. And and I hear what y'all are trying to say, but I can understand what they're trying to say. Is we're not really acknowledging that to the crowd. Okay. They're not trying to steal from teachers. They're not trying to do that kind of stuff. They did give us what we asked. So I'm just here to ask you guys, the chairman and the board, to consider the effort that Jesse has put in to the count. He has stuck up for the county and, and, and had us look at what you guys are dealing with. And because we've accused them of pretty much being too tight with the budget. But he acknowledged, you know, what the county is looking at and dealing with. Um, so I just ask for, you know, mercy. I know Mr. Collins, you're a Christian man, and you have empathy, to be honest with you. Um, it doesn't, I know business is business, but you're still a Christian. And, and I don't, it, it's hard for me to watch you kind of, how you talk to people sometimes and get that off my chest. Um, so I'm asking that you guys would consider our mistake. It was an honest mistake. And I know you hear that from everybody. I get it. I, and I get that too, but it was an honest mistake. And without that those funding, that funding, we're going to lack things at our schools that are doing well right now. Yes, we've hired a lot of teachers, but we're doing great compared to where we were four years ago with low staff and COVID and everything. Um, and then, so that's all. I just ask that you... I know I've talked to um, Dr. Boyd. I know that he's going to look at it next year and be much more careful. And he has admitted that he thought it was kind of low and that seems too good to be true. And I feel like he's learned his lesson that he would um, be much more careful next year with the budget. Um, so that, thank you. Oh, one more thing. Siphon. How are siphons wild, Mr. Chairman? I didn't hear the question. How you, you stated the siphon for wild. Now, as my, my husband, sorry, Mr. Davis was a coach and he loved it. That doesn't mean I loved it. And I was the one at home having to take up all the duties of home life because he was at the schools almost for free working. And I know that's not your business. I'm just saying, if you don't want it, I do. <laughs> so um, I'm for raising the siphons at least. That's it. Just give her everything she wants. I'm, done. <laughs> I'm for raising the siphons. He's, and I'll let him speak for himself, but there are people here that have been coaching for many, many years and have never received a raise. So I don't know when they've changed. I'm not saying they haven't because they could have changed in different departments and whatnot. But as far as coaching and ROTC and things of that nature, they haven't changed. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Davis. Ms. Frank? Yes, members of the board, I know what you're going through as far as taxes go. I was on the budget committee last year. Uh, when we raise the taxes for some budget. Not right, Mr. Cullen. But the four cents we raised it last year. Mr. Cullen? Mm -hmm. it, it went, uh, it's kind of deceiving because we equalized. equalized. Yeah, we equalized. So it looks like it was lower, but it, there was an increase because the values went up a lot. Right. So I understand that, and I understand the citizens. Uh, but I, I didn't raise the taxes. I'm not responsible. I voted no, and I voted yes. So, <laughs> okay. what? But I understand that the citizens don't want taxes raised again. However, coming off of COVID, uh, and we look at the impact that COVID had, especially on our young students, it's amazing. Uh, and the literacy that the access that the state has put on the on the schools now for for reading that means we have to have three new specialists that are there. But that doesn't even touch the behavior specialists that we need uh, because of COVID. We need behavior specialists in every elementary school. We haven't even asked for that because we 
cut this thing down as much as possible for everything that, that we were doing. Uh, the only thing I can say is if we are happy as, as a board and as citizens with not having the quality education that we could have, then we can make these cuts. If, but if we want that quality education for your sons, your daughters, your grandkids, you know, we're asking for the bare minimum. And I know that there's some, I, I know there's, there's some things out there about the, you know, money that are left over at the end of the year and stipends and all that other stuff. I'm not getting involved, you know, I'm just saying that in order to have a quality, a good quality education, that it's not free. Okay. So, I, I, so can, can I have a comment? I thought you already did. <laughs> I just started it all. I answered some questions. Yeah, like just a couple of things, please. Um, one, we've already talked about the stipends, and I think there's a lot of agreement here is that our stipends are should be raised when you compare them with other places in the United States, with other divisions. I think you'll see that our stipends are nowhere near what they should be. And I do agree with you, Mr. Davis, as I was coaching for many years, and um, I, I did it because I loved it. You know, if I could have, I would have coached for free, but kind of the same thing with my wife. Uh, I think that might have been a problem. Um, okay, so the stipend thing, I think we discussed it enough. I did want to say something about the um, this, this step or the compression. Is last year, we helped um, get a raise for first-year teachers. It helped a tremendous amount because we were bleeding trying to get new teachers. We really were. By raising that to 50000 uh, for a first-year teacher that are coming in, that helped a tremendous amount. But we didn't do anything for those teachers that are years kind of four through five through 10 and 15. Those, that's the cream of our crop. Those teachers who stay beyond that fourth, fifth, sixth year, those are usually very good teachers and we want them to stay. Um, we heard a lot from them last year about that they, why didn't you consider us? We, um, sorry, the two of us, we visited all the teachers in all the schools, and that was one of the common things we heard from all the teachers in all the schools, the experienced teachers, is it's great that you now can recruit teachers and fill more positions, but what about us? You know, you haven't done anything for us, and, and now there was one person in particular who was saying, I've got to switch because he was trying to support his family with just on his salary, and he said, I can't do it. I'm going to Stanford, and I want to stay. And he is a teacher that was here like eight, 10 years. I don't remember exactly. So I just want to say something about that's the value of basically this compression and the step thing that we're talking about. We really need to do something for those quality teachers at that kind of five, six year to 15 year range. Next is the idea of using a fund balance. You never know what that's going to be. However, the idea, and yes, you are right, that automatically goes back or can automatically go back to the county. No one disagrees with that. Mr. Rizal is right. However, there are divisions where the fund balance that's left from the schools could also be, to your point, Mr. Shroud, can also be used, um, like let's say that you don't approve what we're asking. Well, is there a possibility that we may be able to even do some of those things if we could get some of that fund balance if you let the school use some of it? Yes, because I do want to say something else. Dr. Boyd and I did something that, that would be good if we could all do it. In fact, we might even share it sometime. There's several uh, tools uh, on the internet that kind of shows where King George County School is in reference to the other 130, 31, 32 uh, divisions in the state. And in almost in several of those, we looked at one, I don't remember where we placed, but it was like we were in the top 32, 33 in terms of all 131 divisions in the whole state. We got a quality system here. And that is because of you guys. You guys have helped do that. We've collaborated over the years. It's very rare when you gave us nothing. In fact, I don't even know if that's ever happened. But I think because we've collaborated together, we got a system here that's in the top 15% of all the schools in the whole state of Virginia. You look at some of the other schools who are, um, you know, who have a whole lot, they're larger, they got more revenue, taxes are higher, and they're not doing anywhere near as well as we are. But I just wanted to say that we do have a good school here, and it's because you have helped us in the past. We don't deny that. Um, I want to agree with Ms. Davis for a minute. If we have not admitted that there was a mistake, please forgive us. There was a mistake. You know, obviously us on the board didn't make it, but we take responsibility for it. I can remember when Dr. Boyd, he called me on the phone three weeks ago. 
one of the first things he said after he told me, he was, I take full responsibility. I appreciate a man that says that. And it would have been very easy for him to say, well, that was so-and-so, but he didn't do that. He said, it's my responsibility, it's my staff. Really, we're the same way. Yes, we take responsibility. Our budget in terms of the expense, like I was saying, that really didn't change. But now all of a sudden, huge mistake, yes. And so I guess I appreciate what Mr. Davis is saying is we're kind of asking, yes, I suppose in a way of forgiveness, but it's far more than that. This is a budget that we need to continue to be the top school, the top 15% in the whole state of Virginia. I just wanted to say something about that. I want to say something about a lot of the positions that you were mentioning, uh, Mr. Collins, that, that um, you know, are not filled yet. What was the total number again, Mr. Thirsty? 28? You know, we're filling them with substitutes or paras or other teachers, and we're having to pay them extra. And they still, there is still a, an amount of money for that position. You're absolutely right. But one thing we never want Mrs. Zersky to do is to stop recruiting. So we're hoping, and, and she's done a fabulous job this year. I think a whole lot better job than we've done in the past. And we got a chance that we might even fill all those. So we got to be careful to even think about that that may be some extra money because wouldn't it be wonderful if within the next two months, even before school starts, we're able to fill all 28 positions before school starts. We can't even begin to think about it. that did happen in past years. We did leave extra money at the end. I agree with that. We're hoping this year that doesn't happen because I have seen, I don't know about the rest of the board, that a lot of that this is one of the best years we had in a while in terms of filling a lot of those positions, even at this time of the year. Um, next thing, I'd be very curious. Um, that you used you said ten years ago was six hundred and five. Is that what you were saying, Mr. Collins? Yeah, I did four years. Four years ago. Can we find that out, Mrs. Eric? Is that difficult? I'd be curious about that myself. We can try. Okay. All right. You have to look at the annual superintendent's reports, all that data. Is it? Goes back many years. Can we get that on the internet right now, you think? Is that possible? Not right now. All right. I'm sorry. Just you had an interesting point. I would like to see myself what that was. Um, all right. That's all I had to say. I just wanted to say, I really do want to say thank you because we wouldn't be where we are if we didn't have a collaborative effort with the board of supervisors for the last so many years. Thank you, Mr. Collins. I'll turn it back over to you. All right. Well, first off, um, Ms. Davis, um, I, I'm sorry. I, I do have a way of being very direct that upsets people constantly. You can make a nice test. <laughs> I, I don't want to upset anybody in this room or anybody in the public. I don't want to upset anyone. I'm asking questions. Ultimately, it's your decision on how you spend your money. Whether I care or not about the stipend, it doesn't really matter. It's the point that I made. If you all want to pay a coach $50,000 stipend, that's up to you. It's your money. All we do is allocate the money. And... The reason I was on the school board is because I found through my experience that it's cheaper to educate than it is to incarcerate. So um, I am a fan of the public schools, no matter how it may sound. I, I want to do everything possible to keep the best school system we have, because we do. I, I know it. Everybody up here knows it. And the way to get to that goal, I thought would be a good idea, was what I just spoke about, was the fund balance. To, to basically give you the 664 up front, and then if there's whatever you want to call the kind of money at the end of the year comes back. And if we have to dip into the fund balance, our fund balance, we can. And then also see where you're at because there can be other decisions made. Once you make a budget, you can amend the budget as the year goes on. Can we reverse that and you just take what's left over? Give us the full amount, and then whatever's left over, you take it and put it back in general fund. I don't think that I—I I was with five of us, and I, 
We, yes, we could do that, but the spelling questions. Yeah, I got a couple of things. Um, so we're not trying to punish anybody for a mistake. Um, the, the language that I'm hearing from, from you guys is a little bit troubling. Dr. Roy learned his lesson, have forgiveness. Guys, we're just trying to balance the budget. Limited budget, a lot of competing interests. It's, it's an honest mistake, but it's a big one. You know, and we're trying to figure out how to make it work. We want to work with you, but the language, in my opinion, feels combative. Um, I appreciate shifting gears a bit. I appreciate Mr. Stroud's comments about, um, well, he left. <laughs> But I appreciate the comment about uh, not discouraging you guys to use your money for your frugally. But that's exactly the opposite of the point that I was trying to make. I want to reward you for being frugal with the money that, that we're giving you and give that money back to you. But the point that I was trying to make is for the last 10 years, the minimum from, that I saw from that spreadsheet that you all gave back was about $500,000. With that in mind, now we're talking about a $100,000 delta instead of a $600,000 delta on the teacher salary. If we give you back, assuming that it's still consistent, you give us $500,000 back at the end of the year, if we gave that to you plus $100,000, that's a lot more palatable. Hang on, please. And then finally, the last point is, what's in that $1 million delta? I mean, there's $660,000 for the raises and the health care and stuff like that, but there's an additional $1 million in there. What's in that? Um, I. I you know, if you're giving back $500,000 a year, that tells me that you're over budgeting quite a bit. Again, I want to want to incentivize that. I want to give you the money back, all or some of it, you know. But but what goes into that? I mean, $59,000 for seven kids to go to Mary Washington. That's a a cap. Well, that's more than a new year, new teacher salary. Seven kids out of a county of 27,000 people. Across the state so to answer that question up front that's what it cost to, to educate one kid in king george county the way that they determined that tuition was by taking that number and multiplying it by the number of seats so to, to your point um a couple things i just want to acknowledge that if i could drop anchor on that i'm sorry yes so just to make sure i understand correctly that the sixty thousand dollars that is the cost of what it would be for one one kid if they were in the school system here. We're just going to transfer that over no. to the Mayor Washington. Eighty eighty five hundred dollars per kid times seven. So so that's seven kids, gotcha. yeah, that are going uh, to the lab school for the for the cost of of per pupil the per pupil expenditure cost. So every kid has a certain dollar amount. Um, couple things. Number one is. We're, we're always. Mr. Boyd, were you finished? Yeah, I was going to answer his okay, questions. Nice. Yeah, I think he, I hope, uh, is that, okay, okay. So typically, and the case is probably true on the county side too, is that, you know, in superintendent school, they tell you to finish with about 2% of your operating budget. If you, if you overspend, then you've bought yourself an orange jumpsuit. <laughs> so in a $60 million budget, 2% 1.3 million dollars. We 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 haven't even got there over the years here. Although we're we're pretty close. We're talking about this. Let me first say this before I make that point. Right now in King George County, leading up to this budget season, we have a finance department of one. There's one person in with King George County Schools, 750 employees. There's a finance department of one. There was a mistake made. I, I certainly hope we don't leave here with the with the feeling or the impression. It, it would be horrible in my mind that we hold this county and these kids and everyone in this county accountable for one person's honest, honest mistake. 715 employees, a, a finance department of one, 250 employees, finance department, I know it's changing, but I think it was eight or nine to calculate all of those things. We're, we're, we're operating on one. And again, I take full responsibility for that. There's a, 
fund balance right now, I think of $40 million roughly. I know certain parts of that are earmarked for certain things. That last graph showed that over the last 10 years, we've put the school division has put back into that fund balance on average a million dollars a year. So about a quarter of that fund balance is money that the school division over the last 10 years put into it because of whatever you want to call it, good money management, Mr. Shroud pointed out, not being able to hire enough positions, working through COVID, all of that money from the school division was put back into it. We're here tonight with a school division of 750 employees asking for at minimum $666,000 and at most $1.7 million. County has a 250 employees and going into this budget cycle, we were attempting to address a $4.5 million shortfall with 250 employees. And I, I know there's, I, I just make that point, but there's, I know there's a lot of calculus in all of these things we say tonight. I just hope that I can stress upon you all enough that we certainly hope to grow our county, um, our, our school division finance department. That's the plan, part of the plan here. Um, and we certainly hope that uh, you understand that us going into this budget process this year was one in consideration of your needs. We're coming to you tonight. I hope, I'm sorry if it sounds combative at any level. We're coming to you tonight to ask for you to please consider our needs. We are a good school division. We're one that's top ranked in the state and we'd like to stay that way. Yes, sir. Thank you. Yes, sir. Um, so just, just so you realize that when I was on the school board, we gave back 1 million. And then when I got off the school board, it dropped down if anybody cares. Um, so we still have questions from the board. Um, Mr. Stroud. Yes, sir. I, I know it sounded like you were just giving your closing argument there. I, I, I'm, I'm good either way. <laughs> I'm good either way. I know we got a lot of topics to go. No. Um, yeah, I got a few things. On the movement of the, the two people, myself, I don't see an issue with that. that that's, you know, I, I, I support that. Um, and if the people move, the, the money moves. Um, but um, trying to get these in order. The, I go to requirements based, and I'm not asking for an explanation. I'm just saying that in the future, as you guys are doing a budget, uh, keep it requirements based. That anybody that's asking for something, where's the requirement? Okay. No requirement, no money. It's got to be a problem. Um, this is a question. Do you guys do inventories and audits of your equipment, the furniture, and stuff like that? We do. Okay. Are there any, like, because, I mean, just speaking from my experience, and we'll go into any stories, you know, we start looking at money's budgeted for procurements of computers and, and, and whatever, a lot of times you have to budget for that stuff because you don't budget, then you're not doing good financial management. But sometimes there is money that isn't spent or isn't used or isn't even needed. In other words, if you don't need the desk, then don't buy the desk. Um, and <clears throat> the metrics and in, in these things where, and, and we're probably not going to metrics tonight and, and, and don't need it. I know I appreciated it whenever you came and met with me, Dr. Boyd, and going through that stuff in detail, a lot of detail, and I appreciate that. And it doesn't top everybody's time here, but but metrics-based. If we ask for something, if I ask for something, um, you know, whether whatever it is, that in, in, in business or whatever, that there's a metric in it. What What is it going to gain? Is it going to improve quality of life? Is it going to improve, you know, the the quality of the meal, is it going to prove what, you know, my transportation be more reliable, but there's a, some sort of a metric space to what, um, what you're getting, what we're getting or what the county's getting. Um, there are 
and, and I don't know who keeps the numbers on this, but I know uh, some citizens that they do homeschooling. And some of them have large families that are homeschooled. So I don't know. I don't have kids in school. And, and I don't know what happens, you know, and, and I don't even know if they, how that, that tax revenue is accounted for and what it's not. They make their decisions or whether they homeschool. But, um, you know, I, I, and there are some states that, or, or I guess, there's somehow that's brought into the equation. You know, whether people, and some people, uh, some citizens I know, um, they don't even, their, their kids, they drive their kids to Fredericksburg to go to Christian schools and such like that. So, but they still contribute tax revenue. And, I, and, and all that stuff washed out somehow. But how do we verify, how do you guys have some means of verifying that students that are going to school in King George are residents of King George? So they're not coming across the bridge from Maryland or not coming from someplace else. You guys have a way of doing that? We do that. It's, it's every school division does it. Um, in fact, we've got truancy officers and things of that nature that will typically go out and if there's a question, we'll check an address or, or make sure that somebody's residing in the home. Uh, it's, it's a constant challenge. And really, when you are a good school division, you do have neighboring folks that want to come here. If you've watched our boards at, uh, at the beginning of the year, there's a, there's a road that uh, it hugs the King George Westmoreland line, Trigger Lane. And, and those folks really want to come to King George County Schools. Uh, but we, we try to stick within our, our boundaries. So... Dr. Boyd might want to talk a little bit about the homeschooling thing and how will you help with that, just to, so you could have a better understanding, Mr. Shaw. But the homeschool is not computed in the state, so we get no money for homeschool. No, no, I know, but I'm saying but, we do but for homeschool. you do support homeschool. Yeah, yeah. You might. Well, let me ask, can I ask a question, uh, Dr. Boyd? Did you, uh, you know, the, um, I'm trying to think the center that gives us the data from uh, Weldon Cooper. Yes, yeah, Weldon Cooper. Uh, you don't work for a month and you can't remember the name. <laughs> uh, the, uh, they give you your school age uh, population. population. Mm -hmm. What is the difference between your school age population and your actual AD now? So we have about, five, to answer your question specifically, we have about 500 kids in King George County, give or take, that are homeschooled. Okay. Yeah. That's quite a few. Yeah. Also, we only have one truancy officer for the whole, all schools. Yeah. We only have one truancy officer to see if those kids are King George residents or not. That's from, yeah. So that's a tight budget there. So to Ms. Davis's point, we have one individual that, that does those address verifications oh. that you were concerned about. All right. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. And I think that those... Um, two more comments. One, the that the bonuses to me are performance-based, okay? I, 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 it's performance-based. Everybody didn't get a raise, everybody didn't get a bonus, it's based on performance. They perform, and that's where you guys' as metrics come in, then that's where they get a raise, okay? Raises don't just go, oh, okay, you showed up to work. You have to perform. And create a way to determine how that performance is gonna be evaluated, and then they get rewarded. And with that, the, Getting them that money back, um, I support that because then the, the better you manage your money, then that gives you your money to use for those raises or, or whatever. It helps with that. And it, you then are more accountable for managing your money well. So that, that's my stance. And I guess lastly is I've got... Uh, confidence in yourself and also in this board. Um, I think we've got a, a good board and that you guys are going to be able to work through this stuff. Thank you. So just a, I call clarity. So how, how often do you guys check your budget throughout the year to see where you are? I mean, at least monthly, but almost daily sometimes. And again, we do that pretty much the budget builder that we get that, that the binder that we gave you guys goes through every single exp every single expense throughout the year, whether it's personnel or or whether it's the stuff in, in right. the book. We stick very closely to that all throughout the year. So, um, so where you where you guys at right now in your budget is just you 
as far as how much money is left over for right so now. So right so far, now, how much money do you have left to spend the rest? So we're right now we're estimating, and again, this ca these carryover funds have largely been a function. So eighty five percent of a school operating budget is personnel. Eighty five percent. So when we're talking about inventory and things of that nature, we do those things, but it's it's very small, very small percentage of our budget. Really, to give us the best estimate, we look at paychecks. And and at this point, if we look at the next, you know, through the end of this fiscal year, the paychecks all the way through June, uh, that'll give us the best estimate that we have on how much carryover funds that we're going to have. It it looks like it'll roughly be in the ballpark of about five hundred thousand dollars. And, so and again, it, that's an estimate. Was it now between? I mean, so that's twenty three, twenty four year, right? Uh, that'll be FY twenty four. Right. So it, with twenty two, twenty three, how much money was left over? Was that the original five hundred we were talking about? That was the five hundred and twelve. Yes. I mean, it, it, I'm just trying to say that we're if we kind of get a closer idea of where you guys are at right now, we we can kind of gauge what's going to be left over, can we not? I mean, we can get close. We we can get kind of close, like. I think the closest we can get right now is based on the numbers that that uh, the finance department gave me. It looks like it could be five hundred thousand dollars, but there's a lot. I mean, when you're talking about seven hundred and fifteen employees and and a lot of different moving parts and the possibility of of any number of catastrophes occurring within the school division, it's it's most certainly just an estimate. Uh, the estimate right now of carryover funds at the end of this fiscal year, and again, we don't know that fully. Levita can probably talk more specifically about it than I can, but we don't know that fully until like August. And, and we're estimating that to be about $500,000. So again, pretty close to what we left off this year, 500,000, I think it was 512, 501,000. That's the estimate again that finance gave me the other day, if, that, if that's helpful. It's one reason why I asked because I didn't know how to do. I mean, I just found out recently that in the past few years, the county itself wasn't even checking the budget until the end of the year. Like, there was no this monthly, so that was horrible management. So I, I just really just kind of wondered yeah. what, what you guys had, what you thought. So I did not get what's going to be left over. So we can kind of gauge that a little bit. Right. Yeah, so I took a lot of heat last year because I voted for a big increase for the salaries, understanding that it was important the teachers had it. But I do want to, I want to clarify something so the public can hear this is quite a few years, we've actually not given or given a reduced salary to our own government employees so that we could help the schools. And, and I know this year we made sure that our own employees were taken care of because a lot of the times they've had to take less of that pay increase because we wanted to make sure we fund the school. So I just wanted that out in the public but one other thing that has been brought up, and you brought up about finance. And so just like the service authority, the schools have had the, the benefit of having a couple of positions funded by the county that like the payroll set specialists that have been, they're paid for by the county and have been housed in this building. And you had asked to, to be brought back because it makes sense. They're in your building for day-to-day -day operations. But I don't remember, I remember saying would give the money until the end of the fiscal year. And then the next fiscal year, the cost of that position is on the schools because that would make sense. And so I would like a little clarification on that because I know when I agreed to it, it was after July 1st, those positions will be funded by the schools. Sure. So, and again, it, this could be nothing more than a misunderstanding. And at this point, it is what it is. So, we, Mr. Bush and I were trying to jog our memory as well, and we spoke with some of the former Board of Supervisors members. Our understanding, and, and whether it was, may have just been a misunderstanding. At the time, we were thinking, so, so just so everybody's on the same page, we have a county uh, finance department of one, as I pointed out. There have been, let's say, two additional finance positions. Many years ago, they said there was a, a procurement position. I don't believe that's the case anymore. There's an accounts payable position and a payroll position that both resided over in the county offices. This happened in 2004, 20 some years ago before we were all here. Our request is to bring those positions back. When we worked with the previous board, it was Mr. Bush and I's understanding that the county has budgeted money for those positions. I know in this fiscally conservative error we were in, and in our minds, we're thinking, well, it would make sense that the money attached with those positions would follow those positions, and it would be 
as I pointed out in the budget presentation, no new funds, as opposed to taking the positions from you know the school division taking the positions asking for new funds because we don't have those funds uh, and then leaving those funds within the county office to I assume do something different with so our thought and our understanding when we sat down and again at this point we can chalk it up as a, as a misunderstanding was that the request for those two two positions coming over would have made fiscal sense to to, to have the funds associated with those positions come over. That that's that's just well. Another clarifier that I understood and why it made sense to give you the positions. We just to clarify, we funded them until the end of the year. So the county transferred the funds, correct, Lavita, especially for the one position. Those positions can classify for for state funding, correct? Okay, so those positions are considered support positions in the county, so in or excuse me, in the school division. Currently, there is a support cap in the state of Virginia for, for um, any position that's not a teaching, administrative, or counseling position. That's every other position in the, in the school division. That's maintenance, every other thing. You, you go down the list, that's every other thing. The cap across the state right now is 26 support positions for every thousand students. Every single school division across the state of Virginia hires more than 26, that's paraprofessionals, that's everything, hires more than 26 staff positions per thousand students. So in other words, we get state money for up to 26 support positions. We've already taught, we hire well above that. So if we were to bring those positions over now, we are already well above our 26 allotted by the state. We will not receive any additional state funding for those support positions. Right, so that goes back again to unfunded mandates from the state. But, I mean, I was on that board. I don't remember, at least my yes vote was not, then we fund it forever. So. Understood. Can I take so, yeah. so So now we're, we're here, we're there, now we're here. So it's unusual for the chairman to make a motion, but the chairman can make a motion under Robert's rules. I make a motion to transfer $700,000 from the uh, fund balance to the school's instructional line items. Is there a second? I'll second that. Properly second, is there any discussion? Is the understanding that we're going to look at it, the remainder, the rest of it, we're going to look at it later in the year, or possibly they're going to make it up with any remaining funds? Uh, the motion on the table is to, to um, transfer seven hundred thousand dollars, and I think that the understanding is not in the motion. I think the understanding is exactly what you said. That's the understanding, but that's not the motion. So is there any other discussion? I don't mind making a motion after that so we can have clarity and not we talk to people from the past. Okay, so Mr. Chairman, can I ask to clarify? You're saying we're gonna increase the local share by 700,000 for next year's budget from the fund balance? Yes, sir. Probably second discussion, all those in favor? I have to do roll call, Mr. Stroud. Aye. Mr. Davis? Aye. Mr. Sullivan? Aye. Ms. Binder? Aye. Chair Bush? Aye. Okay. I would like to make another we... motion. Okay. Go ahead, Ms. Binder. I would like to make a motion that the funds that were are, I would amended the budget that were transferred. I'm trying to do this motion correctly. That there'll be a relook at in it would be August, August to see if the status of your budget to help me out here. Well, what, <laughs> what you're talking about is when the accruals, the auditors finish up with the accruals, and I, I'm assuming you do it like other localities. You have your encumbrances and so forth that carry forward, and any accruals is brought back to the board to approve. So I assume that at that time is when you would address the other issue. So moved. 
second, I think. Um, so to restate the motion, I don't understand the motion. So all is the motion that when um, the auditors are done, where we will revisit it. Okay, and it's probably second any discussion. So I I don't Auditor. understand it either. <laughs> My turn. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Oh, is it money? We have to do no. roll call. Roll call, Mr. Stroud. Well, no, no, it's just a reason. Aye. 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 Chair votes aye. So, to make it more clear that we're moving $700,000 into your budget, okay? Off the bat. Right. And then mid-year, when the um, audit, audit is done, we'll look at it direct to see what comes back to if we reappropriate it to you to help with the remaining 1.7 no, I think he's talking more about whatever our fund balance, our fund balance is at the end of this fiscal year. You want to revisit that? Is that what you're saying? Yeah. Right. Which is fine. So you almost get everything you want, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dr. Boyd, if we can get uh, Lavita needs you to adjust your budget to be in conformance with those changes. Because it is critical we get this advertised so we get the tax bills out to start collecting revenue in June rather than waiting until late July. It's been problematic the last couple of years. Mr. Asabi, um, so the budget will change. We've already approved the budget. Will it be ready for tomorrow night for us so we can do a public okay. hearing? Yes. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. But don't we have to vote on that before? We have we have to our board has to vote on that budget, that, right? You know, making it work with the seven hundred thousand. We can do it now. We vote the total. We'll figure out the details later. This vote to accept have that bottom line budget. The yes. Do budget. I have a motion? <laughs> I think I need to do a little math first. So, are you trying to get the total? Yeah. What is the total? The number was seven hundred thousand, Mr. Rawls. It's but I mean, I need to know what we already so have approved to, to add that to. So you can make a motion to accept the, the additional seven hundred thousand dollars to add into your budget. Yeah, you can probably do that. That would. Be, I make a out. motion to accept the seven hundred thousand dollars into our annual budget for fiscal year 24, 25. Do I have a second? Okay, fine. So I'm approve what dollar budget on most recently a week ago. So not clear. But so Mr. Rose, to see what would if you accept that right. money, then you can amend your budget. Or you can amend your budget. Well, let me be have you done a public hearing yet on your budget? In other words, right now, right now, we approved the other day 1.7, uh, what, 1.7? Yeah, so what Mr. Rolls is asking, I think, is the bottom. He, he wants right. to make a motion that approves the total. The, the total. The bottom, bottom line, because what we most recently approved was 26 million. And it wasn't yeah. 26 million, though. Do you have that, that number? I have to pull it up. Add it up there in that one page. Okay. So that was with nothing, it was twenty four two seventy two, and then with well, it was it was twenty six. We were asking for twenty six one one eight nine. Is that right? Right. Right. So what's the total figure, Levita? Okay. So the total figure for the local composite index will be. Twenty-five million nine. Sorry, hold on. Twenty-five million ninety-four thousand nine hundred forty-seven dollars. 
So you want to, um, you know, you want to amend your motion because it hadn't even been seconded. Twenty-five million ninety-four thousand nine hundred. Got a question at the name. So that's what we approved at the end of March, plus seven hundred thousand. Is that is that what that total is? So that's that. What that is is it's the. So if you start with the FY twenty-four number, that's twenty-four million two seventy. That's current this this current year. Based on the first allotment that they already passed, it was one hundred and twenty-two thousand. What's the rest of that number? Seven forty-eight. So twenty-four million two seventy-two plus one hundred and twelve thousand seven forty-eight plus seven hundred thousand. Which equals twenty-five thousand ninety-four nine hundred forty-seven dollars. Twenty-five, nine. 25 million ninety-four thousand nine hundred forty-seven. Okay. Miss Miss Hoover hadn't totally finished her motion, so she's going to restate it. I make a motion that we approve budget of twenty-five million ninety-four thousand nine hundred forty-seven dollars. I have a second. Second. Any further discussion? Mr. Chairman, are you capping that at five hundred thousand? Yes. In all the years. Oh. Didn't cap anything. No. So what I'm saying is, if the end of the year budget comes as forecasted at five hundred thousand, is that what? No. So it was seven hundred thousand dollars out of our general fund, out of the taxpayer money, mm -hmm. to go in your budget. Mm -hmm. That was the first motion, and it was approved. Seven hundred thousand, and then the second motion from Ms. Sender was the. Well, I heard him say five hundred thousand. Yeah, yeah. That, that means that, means that, that much money is left to the general fund. So, in, uh, so after the accounting. So, so I think Ms. Davis's concern is that if our end of the year fund balance is five hundred thousand dollars, she's asking if the request from the board of supervisors will be to pay more than our fund balance back. Is what you're saying? No. I, I so guess the, the motion not. was that we give you seven hundred dollars, seven hundred thousand, straight out from the fund balance. I understand. Nothing to do with end of year. I'm talking about all we'll pay back. We Nothing to do with payback. Nothing to do with end of the year. I think her question is. Correct me if I'm wrong. I don't it, know how I'm being difficult. I'm asking like. <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead. When we meet back in August, that's what I'm talking about. You said you might you will look at where we're at. Are you going to take that from our end of year balance? No, I said I, I said no. But you stated that you were. That's why I'm trying to. No, I didn't say that. No, Mr. Dave, what, what we're talking about is every locality in the Commonwealth, you have to do under the modified accruals. You have to carry forward all encumbrances and so forth. And then you will determine because the tax uh, for 60 days. You carry taxes back. If you come in and pay your taxes for what we're going to send the tax bill out for, and you pay it in August, it gets accrued back to the fiscal year that we're going to close out. So the auditors will come in, work with the finance staff, carry all of that money forward, and tell us exactly what the fund balance is, what encumbrances have to be carried forward, and then you should know what the school's balance is as well. Okay. I just, my point was I was trying to clarify how short we would still be if there was a cap, or, or, or maybe possibly looking at meeting our 1.7 even in August, the remaining balance. So on the table, it was to revisit that okay. after the audit. It wasn't saying you give back. I'm sorry if I said give back. Say, so, say that. And the revisit, because what, what I'm trying to point out is that we still have the payroll section that we got to pay for. So we're going to get six hundred thousand towards the school, and then the hundred thousand towards seven thousand. Yeah, seven. seven so and that does cover that the, covers the that payroll. Covers the positions, yes. But I think Ms. Binders said we were going to look at that when we determine how much you may have left over or whatever that we're, we're reverts back to the general fund by law. So that was the second. Second one, yeah. So, so we don't know how much that's going to be, we do not but it, it will contribute to what originally what we would like to have. That's it what makes your it point. hard to plan the rest of the budget if we don't know what we're going to get. 
that's true. But I, I think so we're, I, we're, how do we fix a budget if we don't know how to, what we're going to get? So this is the, kind of the best way forward that we can come up with right now. And we would doesn't mean that we won't amend the budget coming up. But at this point, you have more money than you did when you walked in. I yeah, thank you. We'll amend the budget. Thank you. No. I all right, any further discussions? All right, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. Well, let's do wait one at a time, sorry. We need to count for this one. All right. David? Aye. Mr. Rolls? Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Budget's approved. Thank you. And I'll allow you to meet on it tomorrow. Mr. Chair, I don't know if you guys need to tie to your motion. Just about revisiting this again in August. I didn't know if that needs to be passed the way you were motion, and maybe it doesn't. Maybe because we did it already. I, but yeah, that was a concern. As far as we're concerned, I don't know. Yeah, we're. <laughs> I think you, I think you should add it in just because it, it's an agreement between our boards that this isn't the end of the story. Okay. All right. We we've got to understand that the team up here and and Mr. Rosati especially. We've been working on this straightening out a mess in the county for a couple of months now. So the reason why this is a curveball for us is because of all the stuff you've been cutting. We it's just been a lot of stuff that has it worked out. So if they're coming at the eleventh hour and going, hey, there's this mistake, we accept that I know it's a mistake. Okay. I just wanted to be worded correct. Good point. I get it. So what we're saying is is then that there would be a motion. I'd rather somebody else state it. I will if nobody else wants to, but that we will revisit uh, the fund balance in order and amend our budget in August. That's basically it. Do I have a motion for that? I have a question about that first. Can you explain? So I know it happens in August, but then it's like something with 60 days. So how quickly can this happen, do you think? It's like one, like when in August? And the August? The 60 day period runs from uh, June through August when all the accruals have to be done by the auditors. And uh, they'll work with the treasurer, the finance department to come up with that and give those numbers and the finance department will be able to carry forward any encumbrances as the school division, the sheriff, anybody else had that crosses over the fiscal year. And then you'll have a much clearer idea of right. what your remaining fund right. balance is. Okay, do I have a motion as clear as we can make it? I make a motion to move as stated. Okay. Kathy said. Yeah, I think, yeah, she, the, the motion is, is that in August, we are going to, <laughs> we are going to revisit the budget, considering the fund balance that's remaining and make an amendment to our budget. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? All those in favor, say aye. 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 Oh, I'm sorry, let's take an individual vote. This is money. Aye. Mr. Aye. David. Mr. Hoover. Aye. Mr. Roll. Aye. Chair votes aye. Motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Davis. That is a good point to connect those together. Thank you. All righty. So, Mr. Stroud, do you want to make one closing comment? I, I just wanted to offer to you, sir, that um, as you guys are working through things with the budget and your procurements, I'd be more than willing to sit down with you on things um, to see where we can save money. Because I can tell you right now with the county, just in working with one of the departments, and we're not even through there, the $3 million budget. And just in one area, we cut 212000 just in one line out of it. It just may be even smarter. So, um, and, and we're going to save a lot more. And, uh, we're going to save a whole lot more, a couple million dollars probably by the time we're done. Certainly take you up on that. And, and we appreciate you guys. We appreciate you uh, working with us through this, this very challenging issue. So we appreciate the pragmatic approach and, Thank you. Yes, and I want to say thank you. I just, I'm go sorry. ahead. Go. We'll just get, try to get some closing on this and then move on to the I next. I was just going to say thank you, but go ahead. <laughs> um, Dr. Roy, uh, can I request that uh, when you all come back, or maybe even before you come back in August, um, can you give us a detailed breakdown of what's in that $1 million delta that we're talking about? I mean, you're, you're asking for 660000 for the 1% raise plus the, uh, the, new, the new person. We gave you 700, so that leaves about a million dollars on the table. Okay. What, are, what programs are in that? I understand what you're saying. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah, we, we started off talking about teacher salaries. I'd re much rather look at those things. Okay, gotcha. Defending a closing statement. 
I just want to say thank you everyone for coming because we should be able to work together in a very, and, and I think our boards can always work together. So I just want to thank everybody for working together. That's all I have to say. And I, I also want to make a closing statement in this area. Thank you very much. Um, I'm so happy to see that finally in the end, we had very much of a collaborative effort. I think we were all open to want to make this work and God bless all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I, I don't mean to be aggressive. aggressive. I'm sorry. I apologize if I seem a little aggressive. You're fine, Mr. Collins. Okay. Um, next thing on the item is the, um, do you want to take a break? Y'all want to take a five minute break? Yeah, um, I think that's a good idea. Take a bath. Rises, we'll take a five minute break. Five minute break, yes. Okay. Bathroom break. Come back about five after eight.
We're now back in session. The time is 8.10. Dr. Boyd, I think the next thing on the list is the, the preschool. Yes, sir, Mr. Chair. So my criticism or my, or my feedback from the last one is to, to speed it up and not be as loud. So I'm gonna work on both of those things if that's all right. So King George County's preschool is, is the topic of conversation. Uh, we do host three programs through our uh, King George County Preschool. It's the Early Childhood Special Education, Virginia Preschool Initiative, and the Peer Model Program. Currently, we serve about 130, 135 students. Uh, going through, so I'll just say that if you've ever toured this building, then I don't need to say much more. I can provide you some pictures that'll give you kind of an idea of where that building stands, but it doesn't give you nearly the effect that you could gain through all your senses, including smell. <laughs> no offense, Lord. <laughs> uh, if, if you make your way into that building. So I'm just gonna show you quickly and go through these quickly. This is some of the original, or, or excuse me, current pictures, but that's the original plaque stone there of King George High School, 1939. You notice that it has President Franklin D. Roosevelt on, on the uh, building tab there. This is the original door. This is on the side of the building uh, facing, Saint Saint, I think it's St. Anthony's Road. This is the current roof. The current roof has uh, some serious issues. Part of it over the years has been replaced. Other parts have not. There's certainly mold issues. Uh, and, and if you come by during a good storm, you'll see that many parts of the building uh, leak profusely. I mean, like a waterfall type of leak coming down in, in many parts of the building. Uh, you can see many of the Band-Aids that have been placed on the buildings over the years. There's stucco around many of the windows that have since fallen off. Uh, there's window AC units that have been uh, put in the building to, again, as a Band-Aid to provide climate control. It, it was not climate controlled to uh, when it was originally constructed. Uh, this is some of the interior walls of the preschool that, that are peeling and crumbling. Uh, this is all over the building, in the classroom sections, and also in other parts of the building. And then the picture on the lower right-hand side is actually in the, what is now the parent resource uh, building. And that wall is actually in a, in a point where you can, you can see outside. You can poke your finger through. It's almost like paper mache, and you can see outside of the building. Uh, electric seal, electric ceiling mounted heaters were, were placed in the bathrooms many years ago. This is this is so they could stop the pipes from freezing um, throughout the facility. One of the uh, most interesting things I've seen is the, is the fire alarm. It, it looks like something out of the Ghostbusters movies, but it's it's circa 1960. It does not have a dialer, and so in other words, if there was a fire in the building, it like our other school buildings, if if um, if there was a fire since the, the fire department is, is called immediately, there's not a dialer in this building, so a, a phone call would have to be made manually. And this entire building is, is you know, it's been described to me as, as like matchsticks. The entire thing is wood, so it's, it's, um, it, it's a dangerous situation. Uh, and then, you know, these are our students that we serve in this program. Uh, many of these students are our most, uh, they are certainly our youngest students. Many of them are our most, vulnerable students as, as far as uh, health needs and concerns that they have, uh, being that it's a special education program. And uh, I can stop there on, on pictures. All righty. Looks like any need a new preschool. Okay. I think everybody agrees with that. Do you, How are we gonna get there? Do you want to uh, go through the feasibility study at all or not? Yes, uh, sir. No. Okay. So I'm going to open up with a, with a Board of Supervisors discussion. Um, might as well, since we got the preschool on the list, uh, we can discuss the new elementary also. So who's first? Ms. Bender? I'm going to jump out there because I've been bugging about this since 2019 when I took it upon myself and got some heat for creating this infrastructure study with ideas, and then hopefully we could, you know, get together. Mr. Stroud was on that committee to try to to uh, come up with a solution, but we're still here. And there are many solutions. Ms. Hoover had a solution um, about getting the kids out, you know, quickly, uh, looked into it, wasn't workable, but there could be other solutions. But where I'm trying to get to in the end is we know where we have an idea of where we would like to have 
maybe a fourth elementary school with a preschool, whatever, how we figured it out. But it has very challenges. Chairman Bush and I have walked the property. I took our county engineer, Bryce Young, on the property. Being a former cross-country coach that helped create the course there, I know the grounds very well. And so it has challenges due to wetlands you cannot see from the sky. You have to see it on the ground. So if we do this right, my whole last year arguing against the former board about let's not rush, let's do it right, even if it takes a couple more months to figure out how we plot everything, the, the grounds are very tricky and we have to make sure we, number one, decide what we want and we have to cite it now, even if we can't afford all of it at the same time, you cite it now so everything we want can be put on the property. And that's all I've ever asked. And there's been a lot of good feedback and comments about things we can do to make this very workable, including a, a road to connect all the schools, maybe a fourth elementary with the school board attached and the preschool attached or build the fourth elementary with the school board and then have the preschools go out to the schools because you can rearrange the kids. There's, there's many options I hope we can discuss tonight, but in the end, the, we want the kids to have a better and then Sorry to tell a lot of people that think that's the original high school. It's not. The original high school was to the left and it was taken down in the 80s. It's where the parking lot was. And that was not an exterior door. That was the door that connected to the other the other school. But that was built um, during the 30s. Uh, I think it was Federal Works Program. And then there was an added on the 50s. And then the section you're in, I think that was the 60s or maybe the late 50s. But the whole point of the matter is we should do better, but we have to plan it right and make sure we do it right because we have a great site that could be a campus, but it needs to be planned instead of just dropping one building down. We need, if we have needs, we need to do it all, plan it all at the same time. I'm off my soapbox now. Mr. Stroud, you're the building expert. <laughs> I don't want to get to the whole, the whole thing, but who did the feasibility study? The feasibility study was done by Mosley. Mosley. And so to and what, Mrs. What, Bender's what, what point. Was the, what was the, the conclusion? That's what I was going to say. Is the first, fee, there was two, there was a feasibility study and then expanded feasibility study. You guys should have copies of those. And I think there may be a, a, a presentation that shows that as well. The first feasibility st uh, study was just the preschool. The property that Ms. Bender is uh, alluding to is a 47 acre property that's behind the existing middle school and be behind the existing high school. This is the uh, expanded study, but all the expanded study is is the first feasibility study with an added section on the end. If you go through that slowly, the introduction just talks about uh, the needs in the county the second section of the feasibility study, if you scroll down, Mr. Dines, is the programmatic need, or excuse me, this is the existing conditions. So again, kind of the, the PowerPoint presentation that I just went through talks about some of the conditions of the building at that time. And in speaking with both boards, there was really no desire to, con to consider remodeling or revamping that building at all. So they just took a quick look at the, the existing building and what they did there was they took a look at the programmatic needs of the preschool. So if you continue going down, uh, keep going. This is section three. This is the programming. This is important. Uh, so what this is, is it took a look at our existing preschool uh, and, and worked on some, some, some expanded assumptions. So you see you have 14 classrooms in this facility. You have your special, your required special education classrooms, your specials classrooms, which is art for the preschool, uh, your front office wing, uh, gymnasium, clinic, and I think down at the bottom is is a cafeteria, is a food service area. Uh, all of those areas are encompassed in that e existing study. If you continue to, to go down, uh, options they show you, and again, this this is just a feasibility study. This isn't architectural work or design work or anything to that nature. This is just simply taking the programmatic needs and saying, this is the number of classrooms you need. This is the number, you know, so on and so forth. There were three options here. If you go down and, and all, it, all it is, is it adjusts the location or the shape of the building. Continue to go down. At that time, this building was the one that was chose the L shape because it had less, slightly less of a footprint. Uh, because of the challenging issues that Mrs. Bender uh, pointed out about that property. If you continue to go down, 
Uh, then you start to see some work that they did on that existing property. That's the 47 acre track back there. To Mrs. Bender's point, Mosley concluded that there's really only two spots that are flat enough to accept a, a building on. It's the current spot where the existing middle school is, and then further down to the right, which is, if you see my laser point, it's like right around here, is where uh, the second flat spot is that they suggested at that time, uh, the preschool. And, and you'll see if you continue to work your way down, uh, again, wet, wetland and stream delineation continue. So here, the, this first option was taking the preschool, that L-shaped building, and placing it right on top of the footprint of the existing or the old middle school, continue down. This option was, to, th this uh, building here is the fourth elementary school in the feasibility study on top of the footprint of the former middle school. Continue down. You can see if you, if you, I'm sorry, Chris, I keep pushing you around, but if you go back up, you can start to see this bus loop that goes around the side. Uh, this was also part of the feasibility study. The consideration here was getting all of the school traffic off of the intersection of 206 and Route 3. You guys know, if you ever make it through there around the start of school, it's a, a very tough intersection for all the base traffic and all the school traffic. The idea with that bus loop is to connect uh, every building that, that's considered in this study, the fourth elementary school and or the preschool to the existing middle school and to the existing high school so that all bus traffic and school traffic could remain off of that intersection of 206 and, and Route 3. Uh, that L-shaped building there in this option is the preschool and that other flat area that I pointed out before, continue down. Uh, and then these are just the cost and uh, square footages of those different options. So this is the option one, new preschool on top of the decommissioned middle school, continue down. The next one is new preschool at the back of the property, continue down. Uh, and that was all right there, part of the, the feasibility study number one. The second part of the expanded feasibility study, I can go quickly if you, if you uh, again, that's just the 47 acre uh, piece of property in that picture. Continue down, you see your existing middle school and high school in that picture there. These again are the programmatic needs now because in this study, they included a school board office on the second floor of the preschool. Continue. Uh, floor, so this is the floor plan concept for the second floor of the preschool. So again, the footprint is the preschool, the L-shaped building. This is the second floor with the school board offices on the top side. Again, the preschool, second floor of the, uh, second floor is the um, school board office building. So, Dr. Boyd, um, we've gone through all this before. Yes. We've, and we've seen this before. I'll stop not right now, sir. So, um, I don't think there's any anyone in this room that says we don't need a preschool. I don't see anybody saying we don't need one. And um, an elementary school. Um, I think it was discussed with several members of this board that the preschool would be in the back of that and then the footprint would be on the um, middle school, old middle school with the bus loop to it. So now we get to the, the million dollar question is how to pay for it. So I'll open it to discussion. So just to, to uh, say one thing and I'll tell uh, the <laughs> If you look further down, you're saying how to how to pay for it. If you look further down, there's an option in there that shows the fourth elementary school. This is according to Mosley. I know there's some conversation about some other designs, but according to Mosley, the fourth elementary school was 55 million. Just to put that in, in this conversation. But the reality is, is that neither one of those numbers are correct. Sure. Sure. 
um, but we need to start having this conversation about where the money is coming from. Back with the board members. I, um, my suggestion is that, is that we put a referendum out to the voters um, in November see what they want to finance. One vote, and then they would make a decision for their taxes to be increased to pay for it. And neither board would we'd have to go by what they what they want. Can I make a statement? Um it seems like we might need another feasibility study. I hate to say this I to Ms. Vendor's point. Um, and I know I've heard some discussion about maybe we could use steel and be a whole lot cheaper, but then who would be able to do that study? Before I agree with the referendum idea, that might be a very good idea, but it seems like we need a clearer figure um, and maybe another feasibility study that would really put all the pay for that. <laughs> it's just an idea. So the feasibility, uh, if you don't feasibility think we need studies it, then, um, are, are not cheap and they're not really that worthwhile. I'm not a builder, so. Well, so we are. We already know what we need. We need to know how much it's going to cost. Right. What it's going to look like. And so, if we decide to put it out for referendum, um, if it's fifty-five million dollars and twenty-eight million dollars, and that's what the will be. So, so we guess still we work these, with. We still use these figures. That's one of my questions. We use these figures. Well, I mean, you can, um, Mr. Strauss. I'm sorry. He's that, the one that can. That was money. my question: Is will we use these figures for that referendum? Hold on, before Mr. Mr. Trevor. Accurate I, figures. I have a question though, because there is another option out there that some of us have floated around: is that to build a fourth elementary school and maybe parse out the preschools to each of the schools so that it's closer to where people live. You still can put the school board office, you know, with the school because we don't want to maintain a building with only one third people in it, an old building that needs repairs. So that Vendor, is also an option too. I'm sorry to interrupt you. So the the school board building, I, I think is fine. You can do some work to it, but you have to remember that all the servers are there. So all the lines, all these fiber lines that go to, from all the schools, all go there. So it'll cost you millions and millions of dollars just for the IT to move that from that building. Everything goes there. So it, that. That is a crazy cost. Um, so I don't agree with that. I'd like that clarified. I just clarified it. Crazy cost. <laughs> that's nice, but that's your word. I don't have that that information in front of me. But you also consider if you did um, not have anything where the current school board offices are, I mean, we'd have the ability to sell that land. And that would be, I don't know how real estate is, but that might be part of the equation. So the one. Well, if you put if you put the school board offices as part of this whole project that we're talking about, elementary school, preschool, school board offices somewhere else, then on the current land, even though I know it might be expensive with all the infrastructure, but um, I don't know the the real estate values, but it might be worthwhile to factor that into. We'd be able to move all those things and be able to sell that piece of property where the current school board is. Who owns the property? I think you guys do. Well, that's my point. Is you own it. No, we own the. We own that property. Yeah, that's yes. one of the ones you still own. That's yeah. Okay, we and own the, both and the building the, and, and the, the land. Both. I think that, oh, well, that's good. one of the few that we still that's own. Yeah. Own the no, 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 no. The current middle school and the school board office. The school board still owns because everything from Sealston on is owned by the okay. by the county. I thought the middle school during the addition we took it over. No, it's well. We'll, we'll, that, that's, we'll that's clarify that. My name. Okay. So I, I guess. What we want to know from the school board is, what do you want? Okay, school board members, one at a time. Well, what do you need, not what you want? I'm sorry. Well, let, let me hear from the members. Mr. Roll. I just had a question to uh, Ms. Bender's uh, point uh, as far as the option of the preschool and the uh, between all the elementary schools, you could get a fourth elementary school. Um, I wonder what the effect that would have on, on Manning. So 
how many preschool classes do we currently have? We currently have nine preschool classes. So you're asking what effect would the the distribution of, of the preschool program have on? Well, it wouldn't necessarily affect the manning. We could still, we could obviously just divide nine classes in four buildings and be the same number of teachers and whatnot, right? Yeah. So. It's probably it's probably a more cost effective approach in terms of that because when you're building a standalone building then you have additional services that you have to uh, provide custodial uh, cafeteria things of that nature if we were to uh, distribute the program across the division amongst four elementary schools then we probably wouldn't have to pick up as much of an additional services, uh, support services. If I can chime in here too, there, that's an assumption that this fourth elementary school would be a little bit larger and we'd have to redivide the lines a little bit. To oh, absolutely. Adjustments for the extra rooms that would need to be in the other elementary. Absolutely. Do you think that maybe um, you can get Ronan Cooper to, to do a um, study of what your needs are so that we can make sure that the plan is exactly what you want, I mean, excuse me, exactly what you need, so we can figure out, hopefully between now and November, um, if the people want to have That's a great idea, yes, yes. Mr. Chairman, what you all really need is a preliminary architectural report, which is not expensive, but a feasibility study that can, it, what I'm hearing is you all seem to be in agreement that the fourth school is the more cost-effective approach, and I believe you said it could serve more children too. What you told yes. me on the phone, yes, sir. Right. And that that was raised when we talked about that a couple of meetings ago. But uh, if you, if you get a preliminary architectural report, that ought to be able to be done at a relatively low cost because you can calculate most of those numbers off of the, the state. Uh, Department of Education has the most recent numbers and right. so forth, and they could provide it. And so, probably come a lot closer than what that is. I, I think uh, I think the question was, what is the requirement? Because the architects are going to ask, well, what's the requirement? How many kids do you, you need to have? And, you know, things like that. I mean, so yeah. the number of kids will determine the number of rooms, probably determine the number of meals, which determine the size of the cafeteria, which will determine everything else so they got to figure that out yeah and, well, and there's state recommendations for yeah they the, have certain re recommendations you got to meet yeah and and we know we can give a lot of those numbers about how many kids we might serve let's hear from the rest of the board members i know Ms. Hoover wanted to speak if you don't mind i feel like the um the fourth elementary school with the distribution of the preschools is a solution for many reasons um <clears throat> the students then who are attending will stay in that school provided they're in that district or whatever. And I know that two of our three elementary schools are already bursting at the scene. So we could definitely, everybody would benefit from that. So that would be um, my recommendation. David? So a need that King George County has, uh, Ms. Laurie's through getting out of that building, but also we have a need for a preschool for everyone in King George, we don't have that yet. You have to have qualifications. So when we're talking about numbers of kids, are we gonna ever open up that um, idea of maybe opening up to the public that doesn't qualify at the current preschool right now? Because there is that need. Um, I like Kathy's idea. Do you have any reason, Dr. Boyd, why that wouldn't be a good idea? Do you have the classes at every, elementary school and why would we need to expand if we're removing kids from it why would we need to expand well if we open if we um, have a new elementary built then a lot of those kids as defenders said would move to that school and open up classrooms yeah that's correct so what we would do is it, we would open that fourth elementary school redesign our attendance zones at that point too so that we could equally distribute those kids across the division and then at that point, it would create extra classrooms with, within, as Ms. Uh, Hoover said, uh, their home neighborhoods to service the preschool in those programs. We would certainly like to expand our preschool program. It does begin to be a costly venture because preschool is not, um, when we're talking tonight about state funds and, and all of those things, 
preschool currently isn't something that the state picks up a lot of funding for. So it becomes much more of a local responsibility, which is why you don't see comprehensive preschool across the Commonwealth right now. That's a financial answer. But this is the first time Chief, um, Mr. Chairman told us to tell him what we need dollar-wise. Yes, I'm with so you. So if that's something in the future, I would like to hand that over now or when we get to that point. Pro programmatically, outside of the financial conversation, there's no better way than you can, that you can improve the educational outcomes of students in this division as opposed to starting a comprehensive preschool program. If you get those kids started early, provide them the skills that they need to be successful in school, it, every, all the research shows that a comprehensive preschool program is a huge beneficial factor for students in, in any school division. So, can we have to so, Lori? So you don't have to sell it to sell you. It I hear you. Because we already understand it. Um, so but can we ask Ms. Lori what she thinks? Like, as she's a can I yes, sorry. direct to you all? I was, if you don't mind, I was so, in the middle of so this, this first of all, let Ms. Davis finish and then let Mr. Frank speak and then we can see what we're going to go through. Yes. Okay. Ms. Davis, go ahead. Ms. Lori, do you see, um, this is Ms. Lori, she's director of preschool. Um, do you see any reason why having it at elementary schools would be a bad idea? Or how do you feel about that? That's a mixed question. Um, this is my third year here, uh, finishing up my third year in this position. 25 years in this county. I love KG. Um, but when I first got on my first month, uh, I asked all the teachers, like, what what do you love here? What do you, you know, like, what would you stop? The number one across the board of the 25 employees that I um supervised was it it works being together um these are seven special education classrooms one vpi classroom and they all work together with twos threes and fours to support each other it's a little different their peers are not elementary schoolers they're um they're just not it, it's a big difference between toddler and preschool and then elementary age students. So um, I do see that. However, I understand the need for, you know, how it's easier on parents, transportation, classrooms to be in the schools too. I'm prepared to make it work, whatever you all decide. Um, but I will say that the staff feels that, you know, the just the schedule itself kind of lends differently to elementary school versus preschool and it's looked at a little bit differently. However, if it's in one elementary school, we're on like a wing, I think that is okay too. Like, however, we'll make it work, but I know that they do enjoy being together. Um, you know, if you only have one or two preschool teachers in a, in a school, it's just a, it's completely different than having a whole grade level or team at each school for them to, you know, bond with and work together. I'm almost, I just want to, she's amazing. I went and visited her at the preschool and she absolutely loves her job and she loves the children. So thank you for that. It was really exciting and motivational when I saw that. Um, I guess the other thing we could possibly look at is having a preschool under the school board, her preschool, and then possibly opening public preschools to the school. Like the regular, or I don't know what you call them, but not special ed. They, they were talking about universal preschool, um, you know, in Virginia, but I, I haven't heard where that is yet. It would be amazing, especially with the daycare options that we have here in the county and childcare. Um, there's not a whole lot of preschool options for for kids, so that would be amazing. Thank you, Mr. Davis. Are you finished, uh, Mr. Frank? I like the idea of the fourth elementary school. Uh, and Mr. Collins, I like your idea of opening it out there or not referendum for the voters in November. However, uh, and I mean, I've been to the preschool several times. I graduated from there uh, in the room that Dr. Boyd showed where the were poking holes in the walls. I was in that room when JFK was killed. Uh, so I know what that school is, and we need to get those kids out most vulnerable. We need to get them out of there sooner than later. So whatever plan we can come up with for that, and that, that may not be up to the board, that may be up to us. I'm just making that statement that we need to get those kids out of there as soon as possible. 
So can, can, um, can I can, yeah. can I just round this up? Well, can I make a statement? No. no. <laughs> so <laughs> it's right now. It's I'm not going to make a statement, Mr. Collins. Okay, I haven't made one yet. It's not clear what you need at this point. So we're we're just here for the money. So we need to know what you need. And we know that we need the preschool. We, we already know all that stuff. We just need to know what your, what your, as Mr. Stroud said, what your requirements are. And we, so we, so, we, so what I'm asking you all is, can you all do that in yes. quick order in yes. the next couple of meetings so we can get moving yes. forward with this and come up with whatever option it is? Yes, we can. We didn't. We are excited that we're again, we're gonna be another collaborative effort and we'll be able to communicate those, those things to you. Um, I would like to say that um, I, I was a preschool director in Texas and uh, I can agree with what you were saying is that there are some real advantages to keeping the preschool together. That camaraderie, the way that they, they work together as a team is really wonderful. My suggestion is very similar to the others. We definitely build that fourth elementary. We'd be foolish not to, and I think everybody's in agreement there. And we will come up with a definitive plan in the next couple of weeks. We'll do our best. Uh, but I would like to see possibly this fourth elementary have enough room to include the preschool as a separate section, but in the same building or whatever. Um, and possibly, at least for the time being, I think we could leave the school board offices where they are with some remodeling and maybe destroy half. I don't know how that could work. But this, that is not as high a priority as getting a fourth elementary and the preschool is the highest priority of all. And no matter what we do, I like the idea of using the footprint of the, of the old middle school and make enough room for the, uh, the preschool, but keep it all there. I just think there's more advantages and disadvantages. There's definitely advantages to making it bigger and then spreading it out to the, all the elementary schools for transportation, for parents, I agree. But I think the disadvantages outweigh the advantages because of the quality that we can present by having them together. Um, so, but we will, that's a great suggestion, Mr. Collins, and we will we'll call us, we have our next meeting on the 24th. Mm -hmm. And I think at least a preliminary discussion, we will have it and put that on the agenda. And um, in the meantime, I think there'll be, all of us will do more research individually, and maybe even some of us talk to uh, Ken, Mr. Stroud, um, for some ideas about. And Dr. Boyd can talk to, Mr. Rizavi, and so about an architectural design. Yes, yeah, so a lot of lot of moving parts. But um, we'll first, you all need to come up with what you. We'll do it, and we'll then do it. we'll move into the next thing. I just I want to thank you that you're open to uh, listening to those ideas, and thank you, Miss Bender, for having that uh, foresight to be able to think ahead. Thank you. Are you a preschool teacher too? No, okay. I just want to mention too. It's one of the one of the things that VDOT has said that since that school has been used, while we have to fix the bus loop and that. And we still keep in mind, we also, the possibility the land to the left is for sale right now. So that is always a possibility to purchase that land because that would also give us a little more flexibility, especially with the parking lot and how the much, how much 14 land? acres okay. to the left of the old middle school. The EDA was looking into that. Yeah, to purchase it. But that it's important to, to look in that you know the overall thinking and my only comment about keeping the school board where it is that building needs a lot of attention and i know from the citizens they don't mind paying for education but they don't want to waste money so keeping the school board in a building that's seen its lifespan too is is also a concern because we're going to do it right and spend spend this amount of money we need to do it right you're right mr Sullivan. I think that'll be what you say, but, but anyway, um, we've been talking about the needs and requirements. Um, can, can we add a little bit? Can we go requirements plus a little bit to allow for some near-term growth? Yeah. I, I'd hate to build this thing and find out, crap, two months ago we were already over, over capacity. And so when I'm talking about requirements, there's particular VDOE requirements for classroom sizes and cafeteria sizes and things of that nature, but we can certainly decide what number, you know, what capacity we want to build the the school at for example you know potomac originally was built for a couple hundred students and and sealston was a school that was designed for 700 students so that's part of that conversation moving forward all righty anything else mr Stroud? uh I, I like the idea of 
sports elementary school and doing that for a number of reasons. The, edu the traffic and transportation reducing that, parents dropping off elementary kids at the same time. And they, and they start out at preschool and they're already used to the building and all that and they know where to go. Um, this is, <clears throat> but uh, it, well, I'm, I'm looking at this, some of this budgeting stuff and I'm confident with the way that I hope that we're able to move forward with the building things in the county that, um, you know, we're going to get a really nice place and, and save money along the way. But whenever I see these things, I'm like, where's the, I mean, somewhere in the budget, there has to be all sort of maintaining it. Um, you're going to have more ground, you're going to have a, a, a new building, but you're going to have to maintain the thing. So there's other costs that are coming along, that are going to come along with this. So, you know, just because you get a new building, the budget needs to go up somewhere or somewhere. Somebody, we just got to, we got to think about these things. Absolutely. So snow removal, everything that comes along with having this new uh, roads and stuff. Mr. Dennis, anything? And I like the idea of, we're talking about getting some blueprints drawn up of what we want when we chop it out. Right, that's that's the idea behind that. So basically, what a preliminary architectural report does, they would use some of this data and so forth, and work with the Department of Education. I believe they have two architects on board that can help provide data and so forth, and they'll, they'll tell them how many classrooms and things are needed, and that determines the cafeteria size and all those other things, and then they can come up with an estimate of the cost uh, to construct the, uh, the school. Thank you. All righty. So um, now we'll go on to the secondary public comments to address meeting business matters only. Comments will be limited to three minutes per person in order to afford everyone the opportunity to speak. Please provide your full name and district when submitting your public comment so that it can be properly recorded and included in the public record. Is there anyone that would like to make a, pub, um, a public comment? Seeing none, anybody online, Mr. Dines? No, Mr. Chairman. Is there any written correspondence from either, for either board? All righty, I'll close public comment. Yeah, Ms. Bender? Mr. I'd like to make a motion that the Board of Supervisors adjourn until Tuesday, April 16, 2024, at 5.30 p.m. in the Robert A. Combs Boardroom. Second. Probably second. Any discussion? Seeing none. None. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Board of Supervisors now adjourned. All right. Um, do I have a motion to make a statement before we finish? <coughs> Dr. Boyd, be sure to. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Sorry. Be sure to add it to our next board meeting, all this agenda to have this discussion, which means it might be a little bit long so we can get this information. Um, at least enough of it, maybe to look at some architectural ideas and so on. All right, do I have a motion to adjourn? I move we adjourn. I second. All right, there's a motion to adjourn and seconded. We're, our next board meeting is on the 24th of April, which is a Wednesday. Any discussion? All those in favor say aye. 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 All right. Aye. All right. Chair votes aye. We are now adjourned. Thank you. And thank you, Board of Supervisors. Appreciate all of your collaboration. Thank you. Thank you for your patience.